Now this course section is optional. Maybe you came here directly from the getting started course section because I sent you here as one option of learning the essence of Django, one option of learning the most important features about Django. Or maybe you reached this section because you completed the entire course up to this section. Because this course section will give you a summary, an overview of Django and its key features. And it therefore is a great section to learn just the essence of Django in case you have not taken the entire course yet and you got limited time and you only wanna get the core features and an overview. Or it's also a great section if you did go through the entire course maybe even a couple of weeks or months ago, and you want a complete summary of all those core features, then this section is for you. If you just completed the course and you're done with Django for now, you can ignore this section and maybe come back to it later in the future when you do want a refresher or another overview. Because in this course section, you will learn what exactly Django is, why you might want to use it, and how you do install it on your system and create a new Django project. You will then learn how to work with that project, which files you find in there, and you're going to learn the key features that make up Django and that you have to use in Django all the time, specifically working with views and URLs and templates to bring something onto the screen. But of course, in this section, we are also going to explore working with data, with models and forms to handle user input. And we're going to go through the most important features there as well. Now for this, in this course section, we are going to build a complete demo project, another project, a brand new project, which we haven't built before in this course, this meetups project here, where as an administrator using this administration area, which we of course also are going to set up in this section, you can create meetups and create locations for meetups. And then as a visitor of this site, of this meetup site, you can browse the different meetups, select different meetups to learn more about them, and ultimately also register for meetups with your email address. This is what we're going to build, and whilst we build this, we'll go through all these key features that make up Django. So therefore, let's dive right in, and let's start with the most important question first. What exactly is Django, and why would you want to use it? So what is Django? Django is a Python web development framework, which means that Django is a framework, I'll come back to what a framework is in a second, that helps you or that allows you to build websites using the Python programming language and also HTML and CSS, which you will also need more on that in a second. Now Django is built for modern Python using Python version 3.x, and this course will use Python 3.x, not 2.x. And Django follows a so-called batteries included approach, which is also what makes it a framework, basically. It means that Django is a module, a library, which you install on your system, which exposes tons of functions and features which you can use in your Python code, so that you don't have to invent those features on your own, so that you don't have to write the code for all those nitty gritty details on your own. And you can then just use all those features. And Django comes with many features for handling incoming requests, parsing requests, working with foreign data, storing data in a database, authenticating user. It's packed with features. We're going to dive into all the key features in this course here, and that's why it's a framework, because it's packed with features, and why we say that it is a batteries included framework, or that it follows this batteries included approach, because chances are high that it has everything you need to build a complete website with any features you might need. No matter if you need file upload, user authentication, it's all included. 
And as mentioned, we're going to see all those important features in this course here. Now, whilst Django includes all those features, it also is very customizable and extensible. As you will also see in this course, you can configure many aspects of Django's so that you have those built-in functionalities, but you can still fine-tune them so that they fit your requirements and they do what you need them to do. It's also worth mentioning that Django is not a small library or framework for building demo and dummy applications, though you can of course do that as well with it, but it really is production ready. You can build production ready websites with Django and it is being used for production websites out there. So Django is really a tool, a framework, which you can use to build real websites, which you then deploy and potentially serve to hundreds of thousands or millions of users. So that's Django. Why would we use it? I mean, it has many features built in, but is that the main reason? Well, to really understand why we need a tool like Django, let's take a step back and let's look at how the internet works. We got users visiting websites and we got servers that store the code for those websites. And of course you know that the typical flow is that a user enters some address or clicks some link and that then leads to a request being sent by the browser of that user to the server that serves that website. That server is identified by the address entered in the URL bar in the browser. That server might then be doing things and ultimately sends back a response, typically a response containing HTML code, maybe also CSS code and so on, so that the browser is able to display a website to the user. Now the interesting part is what happens on the server. Your business logic that's running there. So logic that reaches out to a database to create data or to fetch data. As a web developer, we typically want to focus on this core business logic, which means we want to focus on the core features that make up our website. That might, for example, be that we're building an online shop and then we want to focus on how we serve and present the products to the user and how we handle incoming orders. But we don't typically want to write the nitty gritty code for parsing the incoming request or for establishing a connection to the database or for validating user input. We don't want to do that. And that's why we use a framework like Django. It takes care about those annoying tasks and it allows us as a developer to focus on the big picture, so to say, to focus on the core features and the core business logic that matters to our website. And you're going to see that in action throughout this course, of course. And for the moment, that is enough. That's what Django is and why we might want to use it. Now it's really time to get our hands dirty and to start writing some code. Though before we do that, here are some prerequisites which you will need to get the most out of this course here. You need to have basic Python knowledge. You don't need any Django knowledge and you also don't need to be a Python expert, but Python basics are required because this is not a Python course. Now you will also need basic web dev knowledge. You don't need to be a HTML, CSS or JavaScript expert. We're not even going to write any JavaScript code in this course, but you should know how the web works and you should have seen HTML and CSS before. And with all that out of the way, now we know what you need to know. And with that, it's now really finally time to install Django and get started. Now, that's the base setup which we have here. And that's not really enough to build a website. Instead, when you build a website with Django, you typically build that website by adding and possibly combining multiple so-called apps. You could say multiple modules or components together. And that's a core feature of Django that you split your overall website into multiple smaller packages, so-called apps, which you then can combine together to build the overall website. Now, that's what I'll do here as well. And for this, I'll open the terminal. Here I'm using the one 
integrated into Visual Studio Code. And here we can now run commands as we do it in the default command prompt or terminal on our operating system, just integrated into this editor and already navigated into this project folder. And in here, we should now run Python manage py. So we execute this manage py file, but not like this. Instead, we now add a sub command, which is supported by Django. Because this manage py file, which we have here, that's actually a file which allows us to use Django command line commands, as we see here. So we can execute certain commands offered by Django with help of that file. And one of those supported commands is the start app command. Before we used Django admin start project to build a new project. Now inside of a project, we can use start app to add such a app, such a module to this overall project. And as I just said, multiple modules, multiple such apps can then be combined together to make up the overall project. And for example, if you're working on a bigger project, let's say an online shop, then you could have one app, one module for the customer facing product pages. You could have one app for the cart, one app for the customer administration area, one app for the customer backend where customers can see their past orders and so on. So you can split your Django projects into granular smaller parts, which are then each easier to maintain and which you possibly could also share as Python modules between multiple projects. So if you have one Django app that contains some functionality that might make sense or might be useful in another Django project as well, then because of this app concept, you could share that app simply by extracting it as a separate Python module. Now that's all a bit more advanced. We're not going to do this in this course here, but we still will create such an app here to contain our core business logic for this demo website, which we are going to build here. And you typically have at least one app for every Django project, which you are creating. So we run start app and we give this app a name. And here, since I want to build a meetups, um, portion for my website. And in this course, the overall website will be about meetups, but it could also be just a part of the website. I will name this app meetups. So hence I'll execute Python manage py start app meetups. And if I hit enter a new folder is generated here in this overall project folder, this meetups folder. And in there we see that again, more Python files were auto generated by Django. And these are now the files we will work in. Now in there, we got this migrations folder, which we can ignore for now. We can also ignore the admin apps and models py files at the moment. Tests py could be used to write automated tests, which we won't do here, but the views py, that's the first important file we'll now take a closer look at. Because with help of views py, and our URLs py file, we will be able to register a URL, which we want to support on our page, and then define what should happen if a user enters that URL. URLs and views are a super important feature or two super important features, which you need in every Django app you're building, every Django project you're building. With views, you can define what should happen when a certain URL is entered in the browser. And a view in its simplest form is just a Python function. So here we could have a function named index because this view might serve as our starting page or we want to load our starting page here. And hence I'll name this index since um, we also typically name the starting page file index.html. But it doesn't have to be named index. You can name this welcome or starting page or whatever you want. But I'll name it index 
also because later this will be there to show an index, a list of all the available meetups. Now in here, in this index function, I then want to return a response to the browser, which in the end tells the browser what to display on the screen. And that's important. I want to return a response here because this function, this view function here will be invoked automatically by Django. So we will not call it manually somewhere in our code. Django will call it when we have an incoming request for a certain URL. So therefore here we want to return a response. And for that we need to import from Django HTTP, the HTTP response class here. And we can then instantiate HTTP response here and then define the content which we want to return. For example, hello world, a simple string which I'm returning here. With that I'm saying when this function gets invoked, I want to send back a HTTP response to the browser which carries this page content. Now this index a function also needs to take an argument, a parameter, which will be provided automatically by Django and that's the request parameter. Again, this will be passed in automatically when Django calls this function for us later. Now speaking of that, to make sure that Django calls this function for an incoming request, we need to tell Django when this should be called and we do this with help of URLs. Now we got this URLs py file in our folder here, which holds our project name as a name, but actually we should also add such a file to this meetups app because every app should have its own URLs that belong to this app. And then in a second step, we can also set up or we can connect those app specific URLs with the global project wide URLs. Now therefore here in this meetups folder, we can add a URLs py file. And in there, we should add a URL patterns variable and make sure that you don't have a typo in there. It has to be named URL patterns written exactly like this because Django will be looking for a variable with that name in that file. So it should be named URL patterns and it holds a list as an argument. And in that list here, we now register all the URLs that belong to this app and which view functions should be executed when requests reach those URLs. For this to register those routes, those different URLs, we again have to import something from, in this case, django.urls. So from this Django package. And from there we import the path function. And then here we call path inside of this list to create a new path. So calling path returns such a URL pattern uh, object here, and this should be a list of such objects. Now this path function, which we call here, needs at least two arguments. The first one describes the path after our domain for which this URL and this view, which we'll soon add, should become active. And this could be meetups. For example, if we do that, we would say that for our domain.com slash meetups, this path should become active. Then as a second argument here, we can specify or we have to specify the view function that should be called by Django if a request reaches that URL. And therefore I will import from this current folder my views file, my views module, and then here point at index. And very important, don't execute index, just point at it. 
point at this function by just referring to it like this so that Django is able to execute it for you once we got such an incoming request. Now we tell Django that we have this path and which view should be executed. Now the only remaining step is that we need to connect this app here to our overall project. And for this we should go to this Django course site project folder and there to settings py. And first of all, there you'll find this installed apps list here. And in there you can add your own app, meetups in my case. So that name which I chose for my app before. You can add it here at the end or at the beginning of that list here, it doesn't matter. Now that's one step we should do. It's also important for when we later start working with models and the database. The more important step at the moment though, is that we go to the URLs py file in this project folder. And there we now connect our overall projects URL list here, this URL patterns list with our app URL patterns list. And we do that by also importing the include function from Django URLs here. And then we can register a new path here. We also have a default path here, which we can ignore for now. This will become important later. And here we now need to again add our path and we can just use an empty string here as a path for now. And this then can be used as a prefix for the URLs we defined in our app specific URLs py file. Now here I have meetups as a path and the idea is that we overall handle requests to our domain.com slash meetups. Therefore I don't want to write meetups here in my project specific URLs py file because instead I just want to use this as a prefix. And that's why we imported this include function. We can now call this here and this allows us to include all the URLs from another URLs py file, from another URL patterns list into this URL patterns list with this as a prefix in the path, in the URL. And here we pass a string to include and then we use our folder name meetups.urls. So the file name where that URL patterns um, list is stored without the file extension though. And uh, with that, we ensure that when we have a request coming in for our domain slash meetups, it will always reach this file first. Here we don't handle it, but we see that we have basically a, a wildcard, an empty string here, which lets through that request to the URLs defined in meetups URLs. And here we do find meetups as a path and therefore such a request would be handled by this page here. And uh, actually as a side note, you should add meetups slash here instead of just meetups because if you do add a slash, you ensure that it does not matter whether you visit our domain.com slash meetups slash or just slash meetups. If you don't add the slash here, if a user enters our domain.com slash meetup slash nothing, he or she will get a 404 error because that's technically a different URL. So adding a slash here is a good idea. I did forget it here. I will add it later behind the scenes. You can add it here already to avoid this problem. And now this is connected. And this was a lot of wire up work. But now we defined our first URL for this first app which we added and the view function that should be executed if a request reaches that URL. So now it's finally time to see that all in action. And for this we can again use that manage py file and start a little development server with help of that file. Which is a server that runs locally on our computer and which is only there for us to test our website locally without deploying it. And we start this server by running python manage py and then the run server command. Now here I get a warning and we can ignore that warning for now. The server is up and running. You can always quit it by pressing ctrl c. But now you can also visit your demo website. 
by entering localhost 8000 in the browser. And what you'll see here is that I get an error, a 404 error for a page not found. And the reason for that is that I entered localhost 8000 slash nothing. And here we only have one for meetups. So overall slash meetups, not for slash nothing. And therefore, if I do enter slash meetups here now, we now see hello world. And that is now our first URL and our first view in action. And I did spend quite some time getting to that rather simple and uninspiring result, but these are core mechanisms at work here. And it's important that you understand that you have apps in your project and how you do set up URLs and views and how you do wire up all those things because you'll need that in any Django project you're building. But with that, we now got our first view wired up here. And at the moment I'm returning hello world and that's of course typically not what we do want to return. Instead, we now want to return a full HTML file instead of just such a plain string so that we can bring a more realistic page onto the screen. Now to add such a HTML file, we need a feature called templates. Templates allow us to predefine HTML files, which we can then enrich with dynamic data with help of our Python code, our Django code, before we send them back to a browser. That can be helpful for loading data from a database, for example. And it is something we'll need later. For the moment, we'll define a static template, which does not have any dynamic data, but which will still already be a HTML file, which we want to send back to the client, to the browser. And for this here, in my app folder, I'll add a templates folder, and it should be named templates. Now it should be named templates because if we have a look at settings PY, we see that in there we find a templates setting. And indeed, this templates feature is a key feature built into Django and Django has certain places where it will look for template files. And by default, it looks in the app directories. So in the folders for your different apps that make up your project. And in those directories, it will look for a templates folder. So that's why you should add such a templates folder there. You could also add extra directories and in the full course we do that for some base templates which we can use across multiple apps. But for this example here, for this course, we don't need that. So therefore we have this templates folder and in there you should create another subfolder where you repeat your app name. So that in the meetups folder I have a templates folder with a meetups folder inside of it. This might sound strange, but what Django will do behind the scenes is that it will take all the templates from all your apps and merge them into one giant templates folder, so to say. And if you don't add your app name as a subfolder in the templates folder, you therefore can have clashes if you have multiple apps where you then have templates with similar names. It's not something we have here, but it is something which you could have in bigger apps. Again, I talk in greater detail about all those things in the full course and therefore it is a good practice to have this subfolder in your app specific templates folder where you repeat your app name. And in that subfolder, you can now define your template files, which are in the end, just simple HTML files in which you will be able to use special features, but I'll come back to that later. For the moment, I will add one HTML file in here and that's the index HTML file, which I want to return as a HTML file for my index view here. Now in that index HTML file, you can create and write standard HTML code. And here in Visual Studio Code, we can quickly create a base skeleton by typing an exclamation mark to get this auto suggestion here and then hitting tab. And this will give us such a base skeleton and we can now enter a document title here like all 
meetups since that is what this project will be about. And then in there, for example, add a h1 tag where I say all meetups and below that a paragraph where I say hello world. And that's of course not the final output. We'll have more realistic HTML code later, but it is a start. Now with that, if we save that file, we can go back to views py and here I now wanna return my template as a response. Now this standard HTTP response, which we return here, doesn't want a template, at least not like this, but we got this render shortcut, which is already imported from Django here, which will help us with returning a rendered template. And therefore, we now return the result of calling render here, instead of returning the HTTP response, and hence we can remove this import. And what render will do is it will create a HTTP response behind the scenes, but a response configured to return a rendered, which means a prepared template. Because I mentioned that templates can also have dynamic data injected, something we'll do later, and render does do that. It prepares those templates, enriches them with possibly available dynamic data and generates the final static HTML content, which then can be returned to the browser. And to work correctly, render needs at least two arguments. The first argument is the request, which we're getting as a parameter here already. So I'll just forward it to render. The second argument then is the name of our template or the path to our template, but very important, the path seen relative from the templates folder. So it's not templates slash meetups slash index HTML or anything like that. Instead, it's just meetups slash index HTML because in the templates folder, we have the meetups folder and that folder contains index.html as a subfolder. That might look strange in my editor, by the way. This, however, meetups is a subfolder of templates, which then in the end carries the index.html file. That's just how these two subfolders are displayed here. So now with that, I'm rendering this file as a template, and then I'm returning a response with that rendered content back to the browser. And hence, if we save this, and I make sure that my development server is up and running. If we reload this page for slash meetups, we now see this HTML content. And that's how we can use and return templates. Now, of course, ultimately, the goal is not to return ugly HTML files like this though. Instead, we typically also wanna add some CSS and maybe also some JavaScript code to make it look a bit prettier. And that's what we'll do next. When we want to add CSS or JavaScript or images to our HTML files, then what we want to do in the end is we want to add so-called static content. Static because this CSS or JavaScript code is not influenced by Python. It's not changed or generated by Python. Instead, we as a developer, or maybe the front-end developer in our team, if we're working in a bigger team, prepares that code, and then it's that code which we can attach to our HTML file, so to say. And of course, that's also such a common requirement that Django has built in support for that, because you did learn that Django is a framework with batteries included, so packed with features. And support for static files is one of those features. For that, you need to create another subfolder also here, again in my app folder, and that's the static subfolder. And that should be named static because Django will look for such a static folder. And that folder then should hold all your static files, your static assets needed by your project. Again, you should use the same strategy as with the templates and create a subfolder which repeats your app name because just as with templates, all those static files will be merged into one big static folder behind the scenes. 
And hence you could have clashes between different apps. So here I'll repeat that app name in a subfolder. And then in that subfolder, you can of course have more subfolders like a styles subfolder for the CSS styles and a scripts subfolder for the JavaScript files if you have any and maybe a images subfolder if you have static images. But here I just have some static CSS code. And because this is no CSS course, we got separate resources and courses on that if you're interested. I provided some CSS code for you and therefore attached you find a base CSS file which you can copy into your styles folder to get some basic styles which we'll need throughout this course project. So now that makes the file available but just uh, to Django in our project in general. It's not auto injected in our HTML file. Instead that's something which we now have to do on our own and we do it by using a special feature of the Django templating language which we'll now use. Up to this point here we just have a standard HTML file. And the problem with that is that this is a static file which sometimes is what you need but which often is not what you want because you want to have some dynamic data. And here I would like to add an import of this base CSS file, a link to this base CSS file which should be resolved dynamically so that I don't have to enter the full URL to that file but I leave it up to Django to figure out where this file will be stored exactly once that server is up and running. And therefore I'll add this link HTML element but for this ref attribute I now don't want to hard code the URL myself but I want to let Django figure out the correct URL. And that is a feature built into Django and we can now write some special syntax here in this HTML file to use the Django templating language for unlocking and for using this feature. Here we can add single curly braces opening and closing and after or in front of these curly braces add a percentage sign and now between those opening and closing percentage sign curly braces we now type static then single quotes and between those single quotes the path to the static file that should be added here without the static folder name. So in my case where I stored this base CSS file in a styles folder, in the meetups folder, I type meetups slash styles slash base CSS. And this will then tell Django that here it should dynamically inject the real URL to that file as it will be served by the server later. Now to unlock this feature we need to add something at the top of this HTML file and that's another command which is also between these percentage sign curly braces and that's the load command where we load this static feature to unlock this static command down there. And with these special code lines here with these special expressions we're using the Django templating language because all those HTML files here will be parsed by Django before they are returned as pure HTML to the browser. That's what this render method, this render function will do. It will not just read that HTML content and immediately return it, instead it will parse it and it will find special instructions like this, execute them, because that's a feature built into Django and then return the finished HTML file or the finished HTML content to the browser. Now it is worth pointing out that loading static files and um, letting Django infer and resolve URLs to static files is one thing we can do with this templating language but not the only thing and arguably not the most important thing. Very soon in this course we will use this templating language to output dynamic content and send back different HTML responses to different users with different content possibly. 
we will be able to load data from a database and inject that into this HTML file so that based on which data was requested from the database, the same HTML file might be used as a shell, but the actual content on the page for example, the actual title or the actual text being output on that page will differ based on that data we fetched. But we'll see that in action very soon. I just wanted to mention it already that that's this main purpose of this templating language and why that feature exists. It allows us to predefine HTML content and have dynamic segments, dynamic pieces in that content, which will be swapped out for actual data, like this URL to this CSS file here, when Django renders this template and then sends it back to the browser. And hence, if you now save everything and you quit your development server and you restart it thereafter, then if you reload your page, you should see a changed output there. You should see that there is a slight purplish background color and the fonts changed. If you don't see that, open the dev tools and force a hard reload and you should then see it. And that's now our CSS file having an effect. And if we view the actual page source, then of course here we don't see those strange instructions which we wrote here, but we see just some standard HTML code and that's the URL Django resolved for us and Django injected for us into this HTML file because of this instruction here. And that's how we can add static files and how we can take our first steps into the Django templating language. Now let's dig a bit deeper into that Django templating language because it's not just there to load static files. Instead, it's mainly helpful when it comes to outputting dynamic content. And at the moment here, I have just some static content, just some text. But later we will be working with a database, we'll be fetching data from there. And now already we can simulate that we have some dynamic data. For that, let's say here in ViewsPy, in this index function, which we have to load all our meetups, we have a meetups variable, which holds a list of meetups. And now let's say every meetup in there is simply a dictionary and it has a title and it then has a, a title of a first meetup, for example. And of course we would have more uh, content than just a title, but this is just a, a first scenario, just a first example. And of course we don't just have one list item, but we have two, let's say, and uh, the second item has a title of a second meetup. Now we might want to output those meetups in our template. And for that, we need to inject that data into our template and then control in that template code, how that content should be output. For this, we can add a third argument to the render function. And that third argument is a dictionary where we can set up any key value pairs of our choice. And we could, for example, add a key named meetups here, but that name is up to you. And then as a value, we define some value which will be accessible inside of that template under that name. And here I'll point at my meetups list. Which now means that this meetups list is provided under this key to that template. And in the template, we can then output it. We can, for example, output the title of the first meetup item. Let's say here in a h2 tag by using double curly braces. So now no percentage sign, but opening and closing double curly braces. This is the so-called interpolation syntax provided by Django or by the Django template language. And that allows us to output content stored in a variable. And variables in your templates are those keys which you set up in this third argument, in this dictionary which you pass to render. So here I have a key named meetups, hence here I could output meetups. 
Now it is worth noting though that meetups in this case is not a string or a number but a list and therefore we might want to loop through it. We're going to do this in a second. For the moment I'll just drill into it and access the first list item and then there the title key since that first item will be a dictionary. And here we can do this with a dot notation which is not standard Python code but which works like this in the Django templating language where we then access the first item in a list with the index zero and then since that first item will be a dictionary we also access dictionary keys with the dot notation. And again that's not standard Python. In Python we would be using square brackets to then access the first item and the title but here in the template language it's dots everywhere instead of these square brackets and title without single quotes. And that will access the title of the first list item in that meetups key value which is that list here. And if I save this, save all the files and reload we see our first meetup here. And that's another feature of the Django template language using interpolation to output a value. Now often you also have conditional content. For example we could have another key here show meetups which is false and if it's false we don't want to show meetups. Of course here false is hard coded but this could be a value coming from a database or from anywhere else. So now in the template we might want to check if show meetups is true and if it is true I want to show this title, if it's false I don't want to show it or I maybe want to show some fallback message. And we can do this with another Django template language feature. We can add a so called if tag. Now for that we again use these percentage sign curly braces. We basically always use them unless we deal with interpolation here. And then there we can use the if command if you want to call it. Here we used the static command, the static tag as it's actually called. Here we use the if tag. And then we can basically write a condition here as we're used to. And we could for example check if show meetups. And keep in mind show meetups will be available here because I'm providing a key named show meetups here in this dictionary. And then we're reading that value in here and using that in our if condition. Now if that's true then I want to show this h2 tag. Otherwise I don't want to show it. You don't need to indent here by the way. Unlike in standard Python code indentation does not matter here in HTML. It does not matter. I'm just indenting it for readability. It's not required technically. But then here we can end this block with end if and we have to end it. That's another difference to standard Python. There of course if you have an if statement you don't need to end it. Instead it ends once there is no more indented content. Here it's different. Indentation does not matter but therefore you then have to explicitly end your if statement. And if I save this if I reload we don't see the title because of course here I did set show meetups to false. If I set it to true then we will see it again. And of course we could also set up some fallback some else case content by also adding else in here or else if if you have a else if condition. Here I just have else and then I could say no meetups found like this and then maybe switch show meetups back to false here, save this, reload and now I get no meetups found and therefore this works. And that's all just some dummy code. We will swap it for some real project code later but these are key features of Django when you're working with templates and therefore you have to know these features. Now the last important feature at this point is the for loop which I want to show you. Because of course here we have a list of meetups and therefore drilling into a specific meetup manually as I'm doing it here doesn't make too much sense. Hence it might make more sense to loop 
through the meetups and then repeat some HTML content for every meetup we find. And of course, we can also do that with help of another tag, with help of the for tag. And then we have, again, basically the same syntax as we know it from standard Python. We can go through all the meetup items, let's say in meetups. So meetups here is again coming from this dictionary, this key here, and then this name, meetup item, is up to you. This is a local variable which will be available inside of that for loop in that template. And here we then also have to end this just as we ended the if block because again indentation does not matter. And then here we write the HTML code which will be repeated for every meetup item. And uh, that could be a paragraph where we now interpolate, which means output in the end, meetup item dot title. And now we're doing this for every meetup item. Hence, if I save this all, I don't see it right now because show meetups is still false. But if I set this to true manually here, then if we save this and reload, we see a first meetup and a second meetup. And that's now the for tag in action. And after interpolation and the if tag, that's the third key Django template language feature, which you will use all the time and which you therefore have to know. And with that, we now gathered all those core building blocks, which we need to enhance our page a little bit more before we then also finally start interacting with a database and with real data. So let's now continue working on this page and let's work towards a more realistic page. And for that, we're also going to dive into more Django template features, which also come in handy when building more realistic pages. There are two main things which I want to do now. I want to use what we learned about templates to enhance this template a little bit and write the actual HTML code which we need for this project. And then I also later want to add a second URL and view so that we don't just have a page for all the meetups, but also a page for a single meetup after we clicked on a meetup so that we have a detail page for a meetup. But let's start with changing that overall HTML code here on this main all meetups page. In here, in the end in this body uh, part here, I want to add a main element with my main content of this page and above that actually a header with my, well, header for this page. And in this header, I want to have a nav bar, which in this case should have only one link, which will act as our logo for this page. And the logo here could be some text like Django meetups if that's the name of our website here. And then here, when we click that link, I always want to go back to slash meetups. So mydomain.com slash meetups in the end, though we don't need to add our domain here. If we just have slash meetups here, if we click that link, that will automatically be appended after our domain and will take us back to our starting page, basically. Now below that, I want to have a h1 tag still in the header where I output some main title, which I want to show to the user. And here, this could be, we got great meetups coming up, something like this. And below that, maybe a, a paragraph with some explanation text that belongs to this title, like find the one that best suits your needs. That could be the, the starting part of our page here. And then in the main element, I want to have the main content that makes up this page. And here we could have a section, for example, where we output all our meetups. So here we could have an upcoming meetups title and below that a ordered list with all those meetups which we want to render. And that's now the part which I want to output dynamically here because we have this meetups dummy array and therefore I want to loop through all those items again to then output them. I will just enrich them a little bit here 
and not just output the title or not just add the title, but also a location, which uh, to keep things simple, could just be in New York. And for the second meetup, it's um, let's say Paris, like that. And then I'll add a so-called slug, which will be a unique identifier that has a URL friendly format and a search engine optimized format. Something like a first meetup written like this. So with no special characters, no blanks, but still relatively human readable. And you see this quite often on a lot of pages that in the URL you have some unique identifiers for different pages, but they typically are human readable and uh, contain some real sentence in them instead of just a cryptic combination of characters, which could also be unique, but is less human readable. And therefore here I'll use these slugs. So that's my updated meetups data here, which I wanna use. And here I'll quickly restructure this to make this a bit more readable now. Like this. And now we got our meetups passed into this view. And here we now did learn how we can loop through them with the for tag and then also end for to mark the end of this. And then go through all our meetups here just as we did it before, but now I'll output a list item for every meetup. And in that list item, we now can output some markup. And I'll add a bit of a more complex markup now. For example, I'll give this list item a class of meetup item, since I will soon provide more CSS styles, which we can add here to have nicely styled meetups here. And then I'll add an article here inside of the list item. And in there, I'll have a div with a class of meetup summary, which holds yet another div with a class of meetup image because we're later going to add an image for our meetups. For the moment, this will be an empty image. I don't have a source yet. I'll just prepare it already, but we'll add the actual image later. And next to that div with the image, I'll have another div, which receives a class of meetup details, meetup dash details, where I have a h3 tag, where I want to output with interpolation, so with the double curly braces, meetup item dot title. So the title of that specific meetup. And below that, we can add an address element, and then output meetup item dot address like this. Sorry, meetup item dot location, since in views py, I added a key named location here. And keep in mind, you always use the dot notation here in the templates. So now with that, we're outputting some markup for all those meetup items. There's one a last piece of markup left, which I wanna add in a separate div right before the end of this article, that div will receive a class of meetup actions. And in there, I wanna have an anchor tag. Currently, it leads nowhere, but on it, I'll say more details and I'll give it a class of BTN. And now all of that will only work if we add more CSS styles. That's why attached you also find a meetup dash detail CSS file, which will actually add more styles, which I prepared for you, which we need for the uh, meetup items we're outputting here. And then index HTML, I'll therefore add a second link where I again use this static tag, but where we now import meetups slash styles slash all underscore meetups.css, this newly added file. And it should be all meetups with a dash actually. And now if I reload, that looks a bit better. Now the image is missing, we'll add it later, but the meetup items look better. The header here does not though, 
because here we also need to add more markup or more CSS classes. On the header, specifically, you should add the ID attribute and set this to main dash header. And on this logo anchor tag, you should add the ID attribute and set this to main dash logo. And with those changes made, that is now the final look, except for the missing images, which I want to have for this first page in the end. Now, before we work on those images and on real data, which we use, let's work on this more details uh, button on this link here. And let's make sure that we have a details page that can be loaded. And of course, that we can also navigate there. Now that we improved our HTML content here and that we added the template features we learned about, let's work on a second template, a second view and a second URL because we have this more details button here, which actually is a link. I'm talking about this link here. And at the moment, this link leads nowhere. If you click it, you just reload this page basically. Now, this link should lead to a detail page, which shows us more details about this meetup and which then in the future also allows us to sign up for this meetup. And therefore, we of course need a second URL and a second view. And I'll start with the view, though of course you can also start with the URL. But here in views py in that meetups folder in our project, I'll add a second view and as you learned, a view is just a function in its most basic form. There also are other ways of defining views in Django and I dive into those in my complete course. They are a bit more advanced and hence we'll ignore them for now. And indeed here a function is all we need. And therefore I'll add such a second function and I'll name it meetup details, though that name is up to you. It acts as a view function and therefore it gets this request parameter automatically by Django, just like the index function did. And then in there, we again need to do the same thing as before. We need to return a response. And here again, I want to return a rendered template. So I will call render here. Now to render a template, we need one. Hence, in my templates meetups folder, I'll add a second file and I'll name it meetup-details.html, though this HTML file name is up to you. Now, in this file, I also want to have a basic HTML skeleton. So we can create this by typing an exclamation mark here and hitting tab. And here, our title could be well, actually something dynamic. Actually, it should be the title of the meetup for which we loaded this page. And we will have different meetups later. We have some dummy data at the moment, two dummy meetups here. Later, we'll have meetups coming from a database. So as a developer, we don't know the title in advance. Instead, it should be a dynamic title, which is output and which is passed into the render function inside of that meetup details uh, view function here. So actually here we could say that we have a selected meetup and for the moment this will again be hard coded. Again later we will of course not hard code this but get it from a database. And then here we could have a title which is a first meetup let's say and uh, we can have a description let's say where we say this is the first meetup. And that could be the detailed data which we want to have here. And I'll split this across multiple lines to again make it a bit more readable. So now this is my selected meetup. Now we added this HTML file. Now we want to render this file. So here to the render function we pass our request as we learned it. And then as a second argument the path to our template. So here that's meetups slash meetup dash detail HTML. 
And then to use dynamic data in that meetup, we pass that dictionary as a third argument. And in here, we can define any key value pairs we want, like for example here, the meetup title, let's say, which could be selected meetup title. Of course, we could also pass the meetup as a whole into our view. That's totally up to you. I just wanna mix it up here to show that both is possible. And hence here, I'll then also pass in my meetup description, which is selected meetup description here. And now inside of that meetup detail HTML file, we can now output the document title dynamically by using interpolation. This can be used anywhere in this HTML document, not just in the body. So we can also use interpolation here. And then here we could output the meetup underscore title. And with that, of course, I'm referring to this key value pair in my dictionary here. So that's the title of this page. Now I also need some styles. So I will add a link here to import a CSS file basically. And again, I wanna derive that URL to that static file dynamically and let Django do the work of coming up with that URL. And for this, we can use this static tag. And then it's the same static path as before. It's meetups slash styles and then base CSS. I still want that file, but I'll then copy this link and also include a meetup-detail CSS file, which uh, I did attach to this lecture. So attached you find this meetup detail CSS file, which I did now add to my styles folder. And that should also be included here in our HTML file. And to unlock this static tag, we also need to use the load tag here at the top of this file and load this static feature. We don't need to do this for for and if, but we do need to do it for static. Now that's the metadata and our styles. Of course, we also need some content on this page. And here I want um, my main block, let's say with the article inside of it. And then there, I definitely want to have the image of my meetup. And at the moment, we don't have an image yet. We will have one later. We'll actually even have an image which gets uploaded by the administrators of this website. And therefore, I will already add this image tag even though we don't have an image yet. Now below that image, I then wanna add a section with an ID of location, because the goal of that section is to output some location information about this meetup. So we can have a H2 tag here where we say meetup location, and then below that maybe an address tag, where we could say this meetup takes place in, and then I use a span for styling purposes, location, which should be output dynamically. And then thereafter in parentheses, and that's not a special syntax, that's plain text here. I wanna output the detailed uh, address. And at the moment we don't have that yet. So I will just work with some placeholders here, location and address. Just like the image, we will later have actual data here, which comes from a database and which is created and added by us. And therefore we'll need that later. For the moment, it's just this placeholder. Then I wanna have a second uh, section here on this page, a section with an ID of details, because in here I wanna have a title where I say, what's this meetup about? And that's a H2 tag with that title. And below that, I wanna have a paragraph with the meetup description. And that is some data which I did provide here in my dummy data. I am passing this meetup description into my template. And therefore we can interpolate and therefore output meetup description here because that's some dynamic data which is available here. And actually in this section on which we just worked, 
I then also want to have a footer below this description paragraph in which I have another paragraph where I say need more details question mark please contact the organizer but don't spam us and then a smiley maybe and then contact the organizer should be a link so I'll wrap that in an anchor tag and give this a ref attribute and at the moment it's an empty link later should be needless to say that this will be a link that should open the mail client of our visitor and automatically draft a new mail uh, with that target email address of that organizer of this meetup. Again, that's a feature we will add later. For the moment, let's just finish this markup and this template here. So now there's one last section which I will add and that's a section which will later hold the registration form which we need to sign up for this uh, meetup. So here I'll give this an idea of registration. And by the way, you need to make sure that you don't have any typos in those IDs because these IDs will matter for styling. So that's uh, this section. I also add a heading here where I say join us. And then we'll have a form down there, but we'll add that form later. For the moment, I'll just say form here to remind us of the fact that we'll add a form here eventually. Now we got this template here. And uh, we got this uh, view, of course, that renders this template. But one thing is missing. We haven't added a URL for this view yet. And we need to do that. Otherwise, there is no way of reaching that view function of invoking this view function. And therefore, we need to go to URLs py. And here, I want to register a second path. And that's the URLs py file of this app. So in the meetups folder, that's this URLs py file. Now, the path here is generally up to you. You can, of course, use any path segments of your choice here, but actually here I want to have meetups slash and then some dynamic path segment. To be precise, I'd like to have a unique identifier in the URL here so that we actually do load this page by visiting ourdomain.com slash meetups, but then slash and then something like a first meetup or a second meetup. So the same template, the same page is loaded for different URLs. And this dynamic segment, of course, then should be used in the view later to retrieve the right data for the selected meetup from the database. So we encode the identifier of the to be loaded meetup in the URL. That's the idea here. So this should be dynamic, a dynamic uh, path segment. And that's, of course, a super common feature, which is supported by uh, Django. And the syntax for defining such a dynamic segment, where you as a developer don't know the exact value in advance, is that you use angle brackets here. You use angle brackets in your path definition, and between those angle brackets, you can use any identifier of your choice. Uh, for example, meetup ID, or in my case, meetup slug, because I want this slug identifier, which I mentioned earlier. In the index view, I added such a slug to my dummy data, and I explained that this is basically like an ID. It's a unique identifier per item, but it's more search engine friendly because it is human readable. So that is what I want to encode in my URL and I'll name it meetup slug therefore. And Django actually even allows us to enforce that only such a value is added here and parse that correctly then by adding a so-called converter here. And there is a slug converter, which we can add like this, slug, colon, and then our identifier, which is up to you. 
slug here is not up to you. And what this does is it tells Django that the dynamic value which we'll have here in our path should match this slug format. So it should look something like this, um, uh, all lowercase with dashes between the words and so on. And uh, it will be treated as such by Django internally. We don't have to add this, but we can add it for even better support of this slug feature here as an identifier in the URL. But now with that, we defined this path. Now we still need to point at the right view. And that's what I'll do here with views dot and then meetup details to load the meetup details view if we enter this path. Now we don't need to change anything in our main URLs py file because we already do load all the meetups URLs here and that simply was one additional URL which we did now add there. So if we now save this we should be able to visit this page by entering slash meetups slash a first dash meetup here in the URL and I get an error. Meetup details got an unexpected keyword argument meetup slug. Now it's not a 404 error, so we did correctly find that view, but Django basically encountered a problem when it tried to execute that view function. And the reason for that is that since we do have such a dynamic segment in our path for this meetup details view, we also need to manipulate this meetup details view function a little bit. And to be precise, we need to add a keyword argument for this dynamic segment. We need to match this identifier, which we chose here, meetup underscore slug in my case, with a parameter of the same name in this view function. Because Django will automatically pass the concrete value for this dynamic placeholder when this page is visited into this view function and it will pass that value into this function through that parameter. So if I would print meetup slug here in this view function, now that we accept this parameter, if we save everything, if we reload this page, you see I get an error regarding the template not existing. We'll fix this in a second, but we don't get that error from before anymore. And here in the terminal where I started my development server, if I scroll above this error which I got, you see here I get the output from this print statement. So that's working. Now it's not finding my template here as it seems. Meetups, meetup detail, because I named my file meetup details with an S at the end. So that should be meetup details HTML. But if we fix that, now we should be able to reload this and load this meetup detail page. And the styling should also be there. If it's not, open the dev tools and try a hard reload here. So that's now our second template loaded here. But we now got some new problems or missing features which we need to tackle. For example, I only got there by manually entering this URL. And I would rather click a button here. But for that, we need to construct this URL dynamically here. And it turns out that we have more than one way of doing that. In addition, if we have a look at our templates, meetup details and index.html, we have some code duplication. The base skeleton, for example, is basically the same there is reused HTML code. The header is the same. And hence, we might want to kind of share code across templates so that we don't have this unnecessary duplication. Because whilst it is definitely fine with two HTML files, if you think of a bigger project, potentially with dozens or maybe even hundreds of HTML files, then having this duplication would be quite problematic. If you ever want to change your header, you have to make that change in hundreds of files. Not very convenient. And therefore, adding such a link with different approaches and their benefits and disadvantages, as well as sharing code, that's what we'll dive in next. 
Now let's start with connecting those pages. And for that here in this index.html template, we got this anchor tag, this more details button, which should lead to another page. But this link here, this ref attribute value should of course not be hard coded because the page we want to navigate to is different. After all, we are rendering two or more list items here and every list item gets its own specific link that links to its own specific detail page. Now, of course, we can start with slash meetups here because we do have two URLs and the detail page also starts with meetups and then has this dynamic segment. So that's now the part which we also need to create dynamically here. And the great thing here is that we can also use interpolation here inside of attribute values. You can use interpolation anywhere on this HTML page, not just between tags, though that is one place where you will often use it. But you can also use it here in uh, attribute value. And then here we could interpolate meetup item dot slug. Because every meetup item we're looping for here will have such a slug because my dummy data has this slug value, this slug key in the dictionary. And that should generate a proper link. If we save this, then here, if I click on more details in a first meetup, I'm taken to the detail page. And please note that in the URL up here, we have a dash first dash meetup. If I click on more details on the second meetup, I'm on the same detail page because we just have some dummy content there at the moment. But the URL indeed is a second meetup after slash meetups. So this is working. But this approach has a small downside. It works, but you can improve it. Because at the moment, slash meetups is hard coded here. And that means that if we ever decide to change our URLs, that we, for example, want to have meetup instead of meetups here, then we also need to adjust all the links we have in our documents. And here that's just one link, but of course in bigger websites that could be many links distributed across many pages. And that's why Django has a utility tag which you can use in your templates to let Django automatically create the proper URLs for you. Just as it automatically creates those static URLs. And that's the special URL tag. You can use it anywhere where you want to let Django infer a URL. And a good example, of course, is the value of such a ref attribute on a link. To use this tag, you use the opening and closing curly brace percentage sign notation. And then you type URL here. And unlike static, you don't need to load this. URL is available out of the box. Now, URL allows you to tell Django to automatically generate the absolute URL to a specific URL defined in your URL's py file. And all Django needs for that is a unique identifier per path defined in URL patterns. And you can set such identifier as a third argument here. Or to be precise, you can set a bunch of keyword arguments and one of them is the name keyword argument, which allows you to assign a unique name to this path. And that name can then later be used, for example, with the URL tag in the template to uniquely identify this path. And therefore name, of course, should take a unique value here. And that could be all meetups here for the first path, for example. And for that detail page, the name could be meetup-detail. The name values are totally up to you though. And now that these names are set up, we want to link at the detail page here. So we can take this meetup-detail name here and in index.html here, use that in quotes as a value after the URL. 
Now meetup detail happens to be a path that wants a dynamic segment value though, because the URL that needs to be constructed by Django will have a dynamic segment. And therefore in such a case, when using the URL tag, you also need to let Django know which concrete value for this dynamic segment should be used in this case here, when you use the URL tag. And you can simply pass those dynamic segment values in order after this URL name here. So we have a white space and then the first, and in this case only dynamic segment value, which Django should inject. And here in this case, that would be meetup item dot slug. Now in URLs py, I will revert this back to just meetups here again. And now if we save all files, you see, I can still click these links and I still see the output here as it should be in the URL bar. So we have the different slugs here. So that's all working. But now indeed, those links here are inferred and generated by Django. And therefore, if I change the URL of this second URL path here to meetup instead of meetups, then if I save this and reload, I can still click that and you see it works, but the link here, the URL is indeed meetup, not meetups. So that's now the benefit of using this URL tag. We don't have to update our URLs on the entire page if we change them. Instead, Django will always infer the correct URL for us. Now our two pages are connected. But we also had another issue before. And that issue was that we had a lot of code duplication in our templates. After all, we have basically the same skeleton for both our template files, then just with slightly different data for the title, maybe slightly different CSS imports, and of course, the different main content. But the header, for example, is the same, and so on. And because we have such duplication, typically in any website we build, Django has a built-in feature related to templates that allows us to define a base template, which is used for all our pages, or actually it's up to us to tell Django which pages should use it. And then we only need to define this base skeleton once, and we can easily use it for multiple pages. And that's what we're going to do here. For that, in my templates meetups folder here, I'll add another subfolder, which I'll name base. And you don't have to create this subfolder and you also don't have to name it base. It's just my personal decision. And in there, I'll add a base HTML file, which holds this base template. You could also create it project-wide in a project-wide base template folder, which you then have to register in settings PY for your template ders, and I do that in the complete course. But here for this example, where we only have meetups, it is enough to create such a local base template. Now in here, I wanna have the base skeleton, which I use in my other templates as well. So I will copy the skeleton from there, from the index.html file here, for example, and copy it into base HTML. Now, of course, here I want to clean it up though. In the main uh, section here, in the main element, I wanna get rid of this section in here, for example, because of course the page content is different for my different website pages. Now the header in general is always the same, though these texts here, those also will have to change based on which page is loaded. And here in my uh, head section, I also generally have the same head section for all my pages, but then there are some differences. For example, the title should be set by the specific page which is being rendered and the styles are also not always the same. And because we have these dynamic, these flexible parts in our base template, Django allows us to create so-called blocks in our base template, which can then be overwritten by the templates that use this base template. And a block is simply created by using curly braces with the percentage sign notation 
opening and closing, and then block. So put in other words, we use the block tag here. And the block tag allows us to define a block which can be overwritten by our templates later. Now, you need to give this block a name, and that's simply an extra value which you add after block, after a white space. And here it could be title, but this name is up to you. And then, very important, you also have to end this block by again using the opening and closing percentage curly braces and then typing end block here. Between the block and end block tag here, you can also define a default value which will be used if the template that could overwrite this block does not overwrite it. So here we could define my meetups as a fallback title. Now here I have the base CSS file, which I want to use on all the pages, but the second uh, CSS link is different for my different pages, and we can also define a block for this. We can have the, uh, the, the site CSS block here, for example. Again, name is up to you. And then here I end this block. And in the header, I also have the h1 and the paragraph tag here, and that should also be settable from inside my pages. So here I'll add a new block, which I'll name main heading, and we can then end that block here thereafter, like this. And we could also again set a default value if we want to. And of course here we can also um, add a subtitle or maybe just add an entire block, uh, which we name header content. So that's some extra content which can be injected into the header, so to say, if a page wants to do that. And now here in the main element, I also want to define a block, which I'll name uh, body. Again, name is up to you, of course. And then end block to tell Django where this block ends. And now we got this base template with several dynamic injection points, if you want to call that like this, which can be used by the templates using this base template. Now speaking of that, how do we use this base template now? For that, to use it, we go to one of our other templates, index.html for example, and there at the very top, before we load static, we have to add another special tag and that's the extends tag. And here we define which base template we want to extend. Now we pass a string here and then a path to the template we want to use for this template to inherit from. And in my case, that's meetups slash base slash base HTML. So this file we just worked on. Now this index HTML file is extending that base template and we can now overwrite those dynamic blocks with our page specific data here from inside index HTML. Now first of all, I'll get rid of some content here because that for example, what I selected here is all part of the base template as well. I do want to set my own title though. And now, therefore, we need to overwrite this title block. And we can do that by again using block here in the inheriting, in the extending template. And we use the same block title now as we defined in the base template. So here I gave this block a name of title, hence in the template that inherits, I also have to refer to this block if I want to overwrite it. And we also have to add end block here, but now between the opening and the closing block tags, we put our value that should be injected into that place in that base template we're inheriting from. Like this. We can do the same for the CSS styles. Here we can add a block referring to that site CSS block here. Like that. And then here we add end block. And then we move this page specific link here into this block, like that. And that general base CSS link can be removed because that's already part of our base template. We can remove that uh, head and body part here. And now I wanna 
inject custom values into this header part. So into main heading and header content. And of course we do that as we did it before. And in general, of course, feel free to try such things on your own first, pause the video briefly and try it on your own first before you continue with me so that you can also practice what you learned. Here, of course, I'm referring to the main heading block now and also add end block here to set my page specific main heading text like this. And then I'm referring to the block header underscore content, which I marked in the base template and end this block. And here I want to have this paragraph tag injected into my base template. And now we can remove the header here. And now I just want to inject this section here into the main element of this uh, base template. So I want to inject it into this body block. And therefore, here we open our block, block body, whoops, bod, body, and also, of course, close it with end block. And then just grab that section here, all of that, cut it, and add it here. Like this. And then here we can remove this part in index.html. And that now should still work. If I save this and I reload this starting page, it looks like before, which proves that it works, but now we're using this base template. And the advantage is that we now have less code duplication. And we can utilize this on meetup details HTML as well. And again, feel free to pause the video and try this on your own. Try using that base template in this meetup details HTML file as well. Here we're now going to do it together. And for this, we can extend our template here from meetup space base HTML. That's the first thing we have to do if we want to extend another template. And then we can define the concrete values for our different blocks. For example, for the title block here, we can define a value. And block has to go here. And here we had a dynamic title, but that's okay. We can also inject dynamic values into our blocks here. So we can still use that interpolation syntax here. Now I also have a page specific um, CSS import here. And therefore, of course, I'll also define my site CSS block and end it here and uh, paste my link in here. With that, I can get rid of that base skeleton. And um, then here, I don't actually have something that would be injected into the header at this point. Though that is, of course, something we can change. And we could say that we also want to inject something into the main heading and also end this block. And then here again, maybe inject meetup title as we did before. And uh, if you did not do that when you practiced this, it's of course fine because that is something new which I added here. Now, what I still want to do, of course, is also define my body content that should be injected into this base template. So therefore here, we'll also define this block and then grab this article, cut it, remove this part down there and add the article here in this body block. And with that, if we save this, if I now go to the details page, that still works. We see the title here as well now, and this is looking good so far. And that's now using this important feature of template inheritance. Now template inheritance is a great feature. We got another feature that makes reusing code a bit easier. And that would be includes or partials as they also often are called. 
With that, you can define your own components, you could say, your own HTML code snippets, which you can then include into any template you want. So the idea with that is not to define a base template from which you inherit and which you use as a basis, but instead the idea is to have short injectable HTML snippets that still can take some dynamic data though. And an example here could be the meetup item, this list item here in index.html. This is quite a lot of HTML code and maybe we want to keep that index.html file a bit slimmer. Maybe we're also using this same code snippet on other pages. For example, if we had some other starting page which lists some featured meetup items, we might be using the same HTML structure on that page and on this all meetups page. It's not a scenario we have here, but a scenario you could have. And for this, you can create so-called includes or partials. For that, I'll add a new folder includes. And just as with the base folder, you don't need to name this folder as such. You also don't need to create it. But I like having that folder with that name to store my reusable code snippets. And in there, I'll then create a meetup-item HTML file. That name, of course, is also up to you. And I will now grab this list item here from index.html and copy that into meetup item HTML. And I still have some uh, dynamic parts here. I'm still using interpolation. I'm still using this URL constructor and that will be fine. But now with that meetup item HTML file defined, here in index.html, we can actually delete this list item and instead now include it with the special include tag. So we can use this include tag here now to include this code snippet in meetup item HTML for every meetup we're looping through here. And for that, we just refer to it as a string here by defining the path. And uh, that would be meetups includes and then meetup dash item HTML. And if we do that and we save all files, if we reload the starting page, we still see those meetup items. So that still works, but now we have a slimmer index HTML file. And if we would be reusing this code snippet on other pages as well, we could easily include it instead of copy and pasting this HTML code. Now, speaking of reusability, there's another nice feature which I wanna show you related to includes, which we don't need here, but which also helps with reusability. And that's related to my interpolations here. At the moment, I'm expecting that this meetup item always gets used in some context where a meetup item variable is available. And that clearly is the case here in this loop. But if I would include this snippet in some other page as well, this might be named differently. Or I might not have meetup item there at all. I might be getting my meetup data from some other variable. And therefore, to make this a bit more self-contained here, we could rename this to just title and location and expect that these extra variables are made available to this template. And you can make variables available to uh, included templates by going to your include tag and adding the with keyword here and then defining your own variables that should be made available to that included template, simply as key value pairs. So now we could make a title variable available, which holds meetup item.title as a value. And we can make the location variable available by pointing at meetup item.location. So now in the place where we use the included snippet, we now define values for the variables expected inside of that included snippet. If I save that, this now still works. And that's technically not something we had to do here, but something which is still a good idea to implement because it makes your included snippet more reusable and more standalone. We now had a very detailed look at those base features related to URLs, views, and templates, which is the meat of any website you're building with Django. But also very important is data. 
And at this point in the course, we're only using dummy data for our meetups and uh, we're not using any data that would really be connected across pages. It's not realistic and it's going to change now. But first of all, what exactly is data there for? Actually, it turns out that there are three main categories of data we could uh, differentiate. That would be temporary data, semi-persistent data, and persistent data. Though I will say that these are definitions I came up with. These are not official definitions. But if you think about the different pieces of data you're interacting with when building a website, you will probably be able to categorize that data with these categories here. Now, temporary data is data like the data a user entered into an input field. Or if you have a list of blog posts where users can highlight them, then it would be the fact that a user maybe clicked on some blog post. It's some data which matters at a specific moment, but which um, ultimately will be lost. If a user enters something into an input field, once that form is submitted, that data might be stored in a database, but the data in the input field will probably be reset, so the concrete value entered in the input field on the loaded page. So that's data which is used immediately and then typically lost thereafter. Such data is therefore typically stored in memory, which means in variables. If we handle the form submission, we first of all store the submitted data in some variable before we then maybe turn it into permanent persistent data by storing it in a database. Now, we also got some data which I like to label as semi-persistent data, something like the user authentication status. If you log in, that of course is an important piece of information, and if you reload the browser, it should not be lost. But of course, at some point, you might be logged out automatically, and if that login status is forgotten or lost somehow, it's not the end of the world, because you can easily recreate it by logging in again. That's why such semi-persistent data should be stored in storages like cookies, local storage, or with help of a session. It's then persistent, but at some point it will be cleared, it could be cleared accidentally, and it can easily be restored. Of course, on most websites you also have persistent data, which should not be lost. For example, the users which you stored in your database, or the products on an online shop, or the blog posts, or the orders of an online shop. That's data which should definitely not be lost accidentally, and that's data which therefore has to be stored forever, until you deliberately want to delete it, and hence you typically store it in a database. And that's the kind of data I want to focus on now. Because in our website, which we're building here, we got some meetups. And at the moment, I only have that dummy meetups list here. Of course, that data should instead be coming from a database. And we, as a owner of this website, should also be able to add new meetups, which are then inserted into that database. Now, the great thing about Django is that it has a built-in support for a very simple database, which will work just like that, and that's a SQLite database. You might already have a SQLite free file in your project folder. If not, it will be created automatically as soon as you start working with that database. And that's a very simple SQL-based database, so using the SQL or SQL query language, and you don't need to install anything else to get started with that. Now, the great thing about Django is that you also don't need to know the SQL language to interact with that database. Instead, Django gives you tools that make working with the database easy. To be precise, in Django, you define so-called models class representations of the data you'll be dealing with in your application, in your website. And then for each model, Django will automatically create a database table where you can store the concrete instances of that model, of that class. And it will give you commands to create those instances, update them, delete them, query them, order them, whatever you want, all with convenient Python methods and no SQL code, which you have to write. And I would say, to make that less abstract, let's get started right away. And let's define 
a simple meetup class for that. So here I'm using the default class Python feature. Now this meetup class should inherit a base class provided by Django. And in that models py file in my meetups app folder, I already do have this import and we need to use this models thing here now because on that object there, we can access the model with an uppercase M base class. And all our custom models have to inherit from this base class. Now in that model class, which you are defining, you can now add all the attributes, all the properties your model instances should have. So you can think of your model instances as objects, which you'll be working with in your code. And you can now define which properties your objects should have. For example, a meetup should definitely have a title. Hence, we can add a title attribute here. Now to this title class variable, which we add here in the end, you now have to assign a certain value. And for that, we again use this imported models object because on that object, we can access different values, different predefined values Django gives us. Because here's one super important thing to understand. Django will take your defined models and it will automatically create database tables in that SQLite database or any other SQL database you connected, but you get this SQLite database out of the box and it will automatically create tables for you in that database and it will create one table per model. So if we add our meetup model here later, as soon as we run a certain command, which we'll do in a second, Django will reach out to that database and create a meetups table in there. And then we will be able to use that meetup class in our Django, in our Python code later, to create instances, meetup instances, so meetup objects, and we'll be able to save those objects in Python. And behind the scenes, Django will then go ahead and add a new record into that meetups table, which it created for us. And that's why we have to add these class variables because with those, we in the end will define which properties our meetup objects in the Python code will have later, but we also define which fields, which columns will have in that meetups table in the database. Django will create those columns for us. And that's why we have to tell Django, which kind of values will be stored as a title and so on. Because with this class here, we don't just create a blueprint for building meetup objects in our code, but we also define the blueprint for the kind of table Django should generate for us. And this models object, which we import, gives us various kinds of fields, which we can create, which will then be created as pre-configured columns in the database by Django. And here we could say that the title should be some standard text. And for this, you have the char field type of property, which you can set up with models.char field. With that, you're telling Django that you want to create a blueprint for a meetup where you have a title property on every object. And that should be some standard text, which is represented by this char field um, thing here. And behind the scenes, as I mentioned before, Django will create a table for all your meetups in that database. It will manage that for you automatically. And it will ensure that the meetups table will have a column called title where text is expected. And when using that char field, you also need to set the max length, which you do with the max length keyword argument. And you could set this to 200 characters. And with that, you will let Django know how it should configure that database table that the title column expects text that is no longer than 200 characters. This needs to be defined in advance to uh, optimize performance and size. And it will also matter in some other place to which I'll come back later, some place where we can create our own data. So now with that, we're defining that we have a meetup which has a title, but that's not all I want. I also want my meetups to have a slug, 
And for that, we actually already have a select field built into Django, which is a field that wants some text that adheres to the select format. So that does not have any blanks inside of it, for example. And here we can also set another keyword argument, unique equals true, to ensure that Django will verify that in our meetups table, we'll never have more than one meetup with the same slug. So if we try to add a meetup into our table that has the same slug as some other meetup, it would prevent this, Django would prevent this, and it would throw an error. And that's very useful. It will also create an index behind the scenes to make querying for slugs more efficient. Now I'll also add a description here, and that should be some longer text. And for that, instead of the char field, which is for shorter text, we have the text field here. And with that, we're saying that this should store some longer text. Now for the moment, that's it. We don't have a location yet, we'll add it later, but for the moment that's it and I'll save this file. Now with this we defined our first model and now we can let Django create the database structure for this model. Now for this, you first of all need to make sure that in settings PY, you did add your app to installed apps, as I did. But this is now important. You need to make sure that this was done because we can now run a special command, if I quit that development server, that will trigger Django to create the database structure. You use the manage py file for that, and then you first of all need to run the make migrations command. Migrations are database instructions, and with make migrations, you generate those instructions. So that's what it did here now. And just as a quick side note, you can always go to the migrations folder in your app folder, so in the meetups folder in my case, and in there you will find those created files. And it did create that 001 underscore initial py file for me. And in here you see the code generated by Django, as it clearly says here. And here we see that code which Django will execute in a next step, in a second, which then will affect the database and, as you will see, which will in the end create a table. That's what create model will do here. And the model is the meetup model for which this table is created. And here you see which database fields will be added. And in the end here you see it adds this title, the slug and the description as configured by us. And it also automatically adds an ID field, which is an auto incrementing uh, number ID field, which it generates out of the box. So that's what Django will do. And whilst we could edit this code, we typically shouldn't do that. We should keep those migration files the way they are. And now as a next step, we need to take these migrations, these instructions, which we did generate based on our defined models, and we need to execute them with Django so that the database is really affected and does change. As a second step, you now need to run migrate. This will now apply those migrations. So it will execute those migrations. And you see it executed quite a bit of um, migrations here because it turns out that you don't just have your own models that was migrated as well, but also some built-in models and migrations that are related to user authentication and administration. Something we'll come back to later. But with that, Django now did touch or create this db.sqlite free file and create the database in there. We can't see it here if we select this file because it's in a different format, but that file now stores this general database structure. Now we of course want to interact with that database and uh, we probably want to create new meetups. And for this, we'll explore another key feature baked into Django, the administration feature. It's very common that on a website which you're building, you don't just have that user facing front end as we have it here. So the page all your visitors will see, but it's quite common that you also have some admin area, which you maybe can visit with slash admin. 
Now at the moment this fails because my server is not up and running, but if I do run my server again, my development server, then you will notice that actually I get a login field here. And I get this login field here because in my base URLs in the project folder, we have a path for admin. And this is simply using some built-in feature Django is shipping with, the administration feature. Django has an entire built-in administration panel and dashboard which you can use to administer your model data. And you can reach it by entering slash admin. Now, of course, the problem with that at the moment just is that we don't know what our credentials are and we have no create user uh, button here. The reason for that is that this administration area is not meant to be used by your regular page visitors. They can reach this login screen, but they can't log in. Instead, that's meant for you as the site owner. And we can create a user through the terminal. If I quit that development server, we can execute the create super user command with the manage py file. This will now open a prompt which wants me to create a super user. And you can choose a username of your choice, a email address of your choice. Here I picked a dummy email address. And then a password where when you enter something you won't see the characters, but they will be registered. So I'm entering a password here. In my case, I'm getting warned that it's not secure enough, uh, but I'll still confirm it by entering Y here for yes. And um, now with that, I did create that super user. If I now restart that development server, on that page here, I can log in with my username, which I chose, and that password. And now here, I'm on this administration dashboard. And at the moment, we don't see anything about meetups here. We can just administer users and user groups, as it seems. But we can now tell Django that meetups should also be data that is administered through that dashboard. By default, your model data does not show up here, but you can register all your model data for Django to show it here. And registering it is quite straightforward as well. For that, we got this admin py file where we can tell Django which models should be manageable through the admin area. Here, we just need to import them from models. I'll import meetup. And then we use this admin object, which is already imported, to call site register and then register the model like this. And if we do that, and save this. If I reload here, you see now I have my meetups area and here I can now click on add meetup and I can add a new meetup. So here I could uh, name this our first admin created meetup, choose a slug of my choice like our first meetup and then enter some description like this is a first meetup created via the admin area. And now we can save this or save this and create another one. I'll just save it. And this was now added. Now it shows up rather strange here. I'll come back to that in a second, but it was added to the database. And now before we fine tune how it's displayed here on the admin uh, dashboard, let's see how we can display it on our user facing site. Because at the moment, if I enter localhost 8000 slash meetups, I still only see my dummy data, of course, because in my views, I'm still only using that dummy data. But that's something we can change now. Now I want to query my meetup data from the database and use that for my uh, meetups in my template instead of using the, the dummy data. And for that, I'll get rid of that list here, which I store in meetups. And instead, I want to use that data from the database. Now, I mentioned that the good thing would be that we don't have to write any SQL queries. Instead, we got this meetup model and we can actually query the database and do database operations through that model. How? 
Well, in our view, we can simply import from dot models our meetup model in this case. And then in the place where I want to fetch all meetups, we can access it. And then the objects property, which is a static property on that meetup class. So I'm not instantiating the class, I'm accessing a static field, not a field defined by us. We did not add an objects field here, but defined by this base class, which we're inheriting. And this objects field gives us rich query methods. For example, the very simple yet powerful all method, which we can execute like this. And this will simply fetch all instances of this class from the database. So it will give us all the meetups stored in the database. We can also chain more methods here, for example, order by to then add ordering, but that's not something we need right now. Here I'm happy with just fetching all the meetups. Now I'm then passing them to the template. And here I now also want to get rid of show meetups. And I want to tweak the index.html file a little bit because here I'm looping for all my meetups and I get my meetup items here. But accessing the location will not work at the moment because um, at the moment the meetups stored in the database don't have a location yet. And therefore here I'll just set a hard-coded value for location so that we don't get an error. Later, we'll of course again use data from the database here once we got that data here. But if we now save this, you see now only one meetup shows up here. And that's that meetup from the database as you can tell by the title. Now I noticed one thing right now. My included snippet here is um, not uh, ideal because I did create my title and location here, but here for the slug, I'm still referring to meetup item slug. I should of course also just name this slug to stay in line with the approach I'm using up here and make sure that in index HTML that slug is provided if I want to follow that approach of making it as reusable as possible. And then here that would be meetup item dot slug. And since our meetup items do have slugs in the database, this again should work. So if I save that and I reload, I can still click this button and that works. Now that we are on that detail page, we also might want to query the meetup details for that page from the database instead of having a dummy meetup here. And of course, that's also possible. We get the meetup slug as an argument here because it is this dynamic path segment that leads to this function to be executed. And we can query by that segment in the database because all our stored meetups do have a slug and it's guaranteed to be unique. So to do that, we now also want to query the database again, but now not to get all the meetups, but a specific meetup. And that's also very straightforward. We can again use our meetup model which we're importing up here. And then we access objects just like before, but now not all, but get, which gets a single instance. And now you use keyword arguments to define which object should be selected. Here we could say that the slug field in the model, so here I'm referring to one of the keys defined in my model, in this case the slug, that the slug field should hold a value of meetup slug. So the slug we're getting as a parameter here. We are looking for an entry in the database where this condition is met. And if no such entry is found, that of course will not return uh, a record. But here we know that we'll definitely have this kind of meetup. And therefore, in this case, we can access the title and description. However, no longer like this, but instead, now this actually will be an object. So we use the dot notation for that. And if we save that and reload this detail page, now you see we got the actual title here and we got our actual description, which we entered in the admin area. So now that's how we can fetch a single meetup item. Now, of course, if we enter some slug which does not exist, we get an error though because we're trying to query for an item which is not part of the database. 
That's why we might want to wrap this with a try block and catch errors like this. And render or return a differently rendered template in that case. So I still pass in request here and I still might want to render the same template, though we could also render a different template here. But then here I maybe set a, a meetup found key and set this to false in this case and um, add that same key to that other render call here where I set it to true though. And then in our template, we could simply check if we found a meetup or not. So we could add a if tag here and check if meetup found is true. And also end this somewhere and define a else case as well. And now we could say if meetup found is true, then we want to display our article. So then I cut this article and I add this here. Else I'll just show some fallback message where I say no meetup found for this slug. Sorry. Uh, of course that should be end if, not just end. And if I now save this and reload, I get no meetup found. Of course the formatting is off, we could change this. But if I do change this back to a correct slug, it works again. And that's one way of handling this error. Alternatively, you could show a different template or you even redirect the user entirely, uh, for example, to the 404 page. There are many options of handling this. As with so many topics, I do explore this in greater detail in my complete course, but this is a basic form of handling this, which definitely does the trick for us here. And that's overall how we can fetch and use this meetup for a specific slug. So we are making good progress here and we do work with some actual data being stored in our database now. Data which we can generate and work on in this administration interface. Now we're not done yet though. We can soon also add connected models and set up relationships. But before we do that, how about adding an image? Because at the moment we got this blank spot here and it would be nice to have an actual image here. And it would be nice if that image could be uploaded by us through that administration interface. And it turns out that we can add such a feature with very little effort. We can add a new field to our meetup model because we don't just want to have a title, a slug and a description, but we also want to have an image. And now here Django has a special field for us, which we can define. It has a image field for us. Now image field, if we add this data property to our class, tells Django that image actually should hold an image, but Django is doing a lot of things behind the scenes here. When you use an image field, what Django does is it will take an uploaded file, store it somewhere on the hard drive. We can define where it should be stored and we'll do it in a second. And it will then just store a reference, basically the path of that file on your hard drive in the database. So it's not the uploaded file which will be stored, but just a pointer to that file, just the path of that file, which is what you should do. You should not store entire files in a database. That's not what databases are optimized for. We do have hard drives for that. And with image field, it's easy to implement this because Django does all the heavy lifting behind the scenes. We can add the upload underscore two keyword argument here to inform Django about the folder where we want to store the uploaded file. And I'll just point at a images folder for that. Now with that, we instruct Django to put the uploaded file into an images folder, but we also should dive into the settings py file and add a little bit more configuration there. You can scroll to the very bottom of that file and we are going to add a new configuration item here. Of course, not one which I just made up, 
but instead one which is also documented in the Django docs. If you copy this URL here, for example, you can dive into the official Django documentation, which is really detailed and really great. And here you can learn about all the settings you can add to your settings py file. Now, the vast majority of those settings uh, will rarely matter to you, but now I do need to add some settings related to file upload. To be precise, we need to add a media root variable here and a media URL variable, both written exactly like this. With media root, we tell Django where all these uploaded files should be stored in general. Yes, I did say that uploaded images should be stored in an images folder, but imagine that you have a bigger project and you have different kinds of files that can be uploaded for different models, maybe some PDF documents, some images, whatever, then you typically don't want to store them all into the same folder, but you might have one root upload folder and then you have subfolders like images inside of that root folder where the uploaded files get stored in. And that's exactly what I want here as well. And for this we set media root equal to baster, which is a variable defined in the settings py file at the top. This basically just points at your overall project directory. So this is just an absolute path to your overall project directory. And we take this absolute path and then use this Python syntax to concatenate a subfolder. To be precise here, I'll add the uploads subfolder, telling Django that all uploaded files should generally go into an uploads folder in our overall project folder. And then for the images specifically uploaded for this model, they will go into a subfolder of this uploads folder named images. So that's one setting we have to add. The media URL then should be slash files slash, for example, and this will simply be the URL under which these files are served. And Django will take care of mapping the folder structure on our server, so in our project here, to the URL uh, for which the files will be requested. With these two settings added here, we can back, go back to models.py and save that file. And now we need to do two important things. I'm getting an error down there that I need to install an extra package because as soon as you start working with images or with the image field specifically, you need to install the pillow image, which is an image Django uses under the hood for working with that image. And this error message also gives us the command we should execute to install this package. So I will quickly do that and run python-m pip install pillow to install this package into my, uh, on my system here, or in my case, into this virtual environment. And once pillow is installed, we gotta do one other thing. Keep in mind that we changed this meetup model and we did create a meetup based on the previous version of that model before. And in the database, we still have the structure for the old version of the model, so without the image field. So in the database, there will be a meetups table without an image column. And that's something we have to change. And therefore, we need to create new migrations, new instructions for Django on how to update the database and the existing meetup table in there. And we will also need to instruct Django what it should do with possibly existing meetup instances that already are in the database. We do already have one. We created a meetup through the admin interface a couple of minutes ago. But even if you would not have one, you will need to tell Django what it should do with possibly existing records because it will not check whether there are records or not before it applies these new migrations. So that's something we'll have to do, but still to make work a little bit easier for us, I'll also go ahead and I will delete this existing instance which we have in the database for now so that we clean up the database and then we'll create and run these new migrations. So therefore I'm back in my admin area here 
And then I'll start by deleting that meetup. And you see, if I click on meetups, I now get an error that we don't have a column for this um, meetup image field. Now, there are various ways of working around that. The easiest way right now is to just comment out this new field, save that and reload. And now I'll delete this meetup, which we created before by selecting it and selecting delete selected meetup. Yes. And thereafter, I'll comment back in this image field. And now we need to create new migrations by running manage py make migrations. And I'm now getting a message here that I'm trying to add a non nullable field, which means it must not be empty to meetup without a default. So that means that of course, in the database, I already have a meetups folder. And up to this point, we did not have a image column in there. Now that's why I'm getting this warning because I'm changing that structure. And now here it's asking me whether for existing records, which we might have, which we don't have here, we know that, but we could have some, I want to provide a default value, or if I don't want to make the migrations right now, and instead allow image to be null. So that if I had existing records, which obviously don't have an image yet, because they were created based on the old structure here, I then allow them to not have an image. Now I don't want to do that. I want to force every record to have an image and I cleared all records anyways. So I will provide a one off default by picking one here. And I'll now insert a default value. And I'll just enter test here as a string. So with quotes around it. And with that, I did provide that default value for any existing records we might have. But of course, as I said, we don't have any. Now as a next step, we now need to run these new migrations by running the migrate command again. And with that the database now was updated. And now the meetups, uh, we create need an image. And we can see this right away. If I add a new meetup, and of course, for that, we should restart that development server first with run server. Then here, if I add a new meetup, now we got this image field. And that's the great thing. We automatically get a file picker here. So we automatically got this integrated file upload functionality. As I mentioned, Django will be doing all the heavy lifting behind the scenes. So here, I'll just say um, our first meetup again, and then we can define our slug. And then um, the description, this is a first meetup again. And now we can choose a file. And for this, I did prepare a file here. You can of course pick any image you want. And I'll upload this and click save. Now a new meetup was created, but this meetup now also comes with an image. And we can see this if I inspect this here. Now, the image, as you can see, is not getting served though, we can't view the image. And that's something which we have to fix in our code. Because indeed, out of the box, the image upload works. And we did also adjust our settings to tell Django where that image should be stored. But serving user uploaded files is something we have to configure separately. So uploading our image worked with help of that image field, but viewing it, previewing it, for example, by clicking on this link here in the admin panel, that does not work. Because at the moment, our files are uploaded, but not served. Now we can see that they are uploaded because there is an uploads folder. And in there, there is an images folder. And there I can find the image which I did upload. So that does work. But as I just said, serving them does not yet work. Now to make it work, we need to go to our main URLs py file in that folder which carries our project name. And there we need to add something to URL patterns, though not as an entry inside of that list. But instead we concatenate something by adding a plus after the list. That's something we can do in Python. 
And then here, we basically need to tell Python or Django that it should not just um, use these URLs and serve those pages, but also serve what we add thereafter. And for that, we want to tell Python to serve some files statically. Now, I did talk about static files before. We do have static files already, our CSS files, for example. Now, these are static files which we as a developer add in advance during development. File uploads, of course, are added at runtime by the users or administrators of our site. So that's different. They're not added in advance. Django out of the box during development serves those developer added CSS and so on files. So these developer added static files are served out of the box during development. For deployment, I dive deeply into that in my full course and I show how to configure a web server to serve your static files as well. But during development, we don't have to worry about that. For user uploaded files, it's different. Those are not served out of the box and we therefore have to add this code which we are about to add to make Django serve them. And for this we first of all need to import something from django.conf.urls.static and we import the static function from there. And then here we call that static function and concatenate the result of calling that function to our servable URLs. Now here we want to serve our upload folder under a certain URL, under a certain path that can be requested by the browser. And here I want to use the values defined in my settings. That's the uploads folder and that's the path that should be used by the browser to then request my files. And therefore static first of all takes that browser path and then the actual upload folder. Now for this we need to import those values from our settings and the most elegant and best way of doing that is to actually import Django conf or from there import settings. And that gives you access to the settings you defined here and any other default settings Django might have. And then here we can reach out to settings media URL so that we say that this is the path um, which the browser can uh, send requests to. And if a request reaches that path, then that's the second value for static. We serve a certain uh, folder and the files in that folder. And actually that's not the second argument, but a keyword argument, which I add here, the document root keyword argument. And here I want to set this to settings.media underscore root. And that is that. A folder, that path here on our server, which we defined here. And now with that, if we saved it all, and if we then restart our development server, if I reload this single meetup page, now if I click this link, I can preview this image. It's a pretty big image here, but previewing works. Now, of course, that's just the administration area. We will also, of course, work on the user-facing frontend and to display our images there. And that's actually the next thing I want to do there. Because if we have a look at our user-facing uh, frontend, so to say, then we only see this uh, placeholder. Well, for that, of course, we got our templates. And in the templates, in the meetup item include snippet, to be precise, I have my image element here and there we just need to plug in our image source now. Now the great thing about Django, which is why it's really amazing, is that it makes it super simple. We don't have to manually come up with the URL of the image. No, we can just go here and expect to get the image, let's say. This is up to you since we're in this include snippet anyways. We'll have to make sure that this variable is provided to the snippet and we'll do this in a second. And then here for alt, we could, for example, use the title again, which we already use here. And then, and that's the interesting part, in the place where I use this snippet, where I now need to set this image variable, which is this index.html file here, there I can add this here, for example, set my image variable. And now we just 
have to reach out to our meetup item, which is uh, one instance of that meetup class, which we defined before, of our meetup model. And there in that model, keep in mind, we have that image field named image. We can now access this image field just as we accessed the title before as well. And this image field now actually is an object created under the hood by Django, which has a URL property, a URL field. And that's then the URL to the uploaded image. And we as a developer don't have to worry about constructing the full path, about uh, finding out the file name that was uploaded. We just access this URL property on our image property on our model, and that's it. If I now save that and I reload this page, boom, here's my image. And that's how easy it is to add file upload and to then serve those files to your visitors with Django. Now that we implemented this image functionality, let's come back to this administration area. We get this out of the box, but that also means that we got its look and its behavior out of the box. And for the most part that works and that's absolutely fine, but you might want to customize this uh, area and what's showing up there. Now I will say it right away, there are many things you can customize here. You can customize basically everything, including the styles. Here I got this dark mode out of the box. You can change everything, what shows up where, which menu items you have and so on. And the official docs are the best place to learn about all of that because I, you could create a course just about that, but I'm not sure if that would be too interesting. Now, I do dive a bit deeper into that in my complete guide, but I also want to show you some interesting settings, some settings and features which you will probably use quite a bit here now. And for that, let's go back to this admin py file where we registered our meetup model. By registering a model here in this admin file, we make sure that we can manage this model and its instances, so the records in the database, through this administration area. But we can also fine tune how things show up here and how we can manage data. And let's start with what we see here. At the moment for the meetups I created, I see meetup object one here. Now that's not too helpful if we're honest. It would probably be nicer to see the title here or something like this. And you can tweak such things. Now for one, you can go to the models file and then actually change how that model or how an instance based on that class is represented if it's printed as a string, which is what happens here. Django just calls the str method on our instance and then prints the result here. And we can overwrite this method by defining our own str method here instead of the class. This double underscore str double underscore method is a default method which we can add in any Python class to control what's showing up or what we get as a result if we need um, this instance as a string. And here you can then return whichever string you want. And for example, we could return a F string here, so a formatted string, and output self dot title, and then maybe a dash, and output self dot um, slug or something like this. And if I save that and I then reload this page, now I see this output, which is a bit more meaningful. But that's not all we can do. We can also add multiple columns here instead, instead of just having one string that represents the instance, which then uh, describes our model and our stored data here in even greater detail. And that's what we do in this admin py file. Here in this file, we can create a class and we can name it meetup admin, though that name is up to you. But the important thing is that this class has to inherit from the admin model admin class, which is provided by Django. And then here we can control how our meetups should be presented in the admin area and how they should behave here. And uh, for example, we can add the list display uh, property here, 
because we inherit from model admin and set this to a tuple. And then here we can set the different uh, fields which we have in our model class that should show up as columns on this screen. So for example here we could add the title and maybe the slug like this. Then we just have to tell Django that this admin class is used to configure the admin model in the admin area and uh, we do that by registering our meetup with a second argument where we point at the admin class we want to use for defining the configuration for this model in the admin area like this. And if we do that and save everything and I reload now we got two columns here. And you can add all your model fields as columns. So whatever you defined as a field here in your model, you can add it as a column here with list display. Now we could even make our models filterable so that if we have multiple instances of the meetup model, multiple records, we can easily filter for them because this admin area, which we get by Django, has built-in filter capabilities. For that, to unlock those capabilities, we just have to add list filter as a property and then provide a tuple of values by which you want to be able to filter. For example, again, the title maybe. And if we do this, let's make it a tuple by adding a comma. If we do this, then if I reload, we get this filter box now. It's added automatically because now we added this list filter setting here, so to say. And here we can now filter by title and therefore make sure that we only view the meetups we want to see. Of course, filtering by title might not make too much sense. Filtering by location might be better, but that's something I'll come back to later once we did add a location to our um, model here. Now there's one other thing I'd like to tweak here. When we add a new meetup, we currently have to enter the title, that makes sense, but also the slug. And of course it's easy to mess something up there. It would be great if that slug would be auto-generated based on the title. And that is such a common requirement that Django has built in support for it. We can add a pre-populated fields setting or property to this meetup admin class and then here set a dictionary as a value where we point at the different model fields which we want to pre-populate based on some other value. So if I want to pre-populate the slug field based on the title, I can do this by adding slug as a key here in the dictionary. And as a value, I add a tuple where I list all the fields that will be concatenated and transformed together to build a slug. In my case, just the title field, so just title as a string. And then with that, if you do this, you will notice that now if I type a second meetup here, the slug gets auto-populated. And that's of course again super useful. And please note, by the way, that Django automatically knew how to generate such a slug because we told it to pre-populate the slug field and Django then has a look at our model, sees that this is of type slug field and then automatically infers the correct way of generating such a slug. So that's really a lot of smart functionality built in. And of course it should be needless to say that with those rich configuration options I showed you briefly here, you can configure everything and you can also overwrite how things are pre-populated, but the default works pretty well for us here. And now with that we tweaked the admin area a little bit and we make sure that we now have an easier way when it comes to working with our data there and when it comes to understanding our data and adding our data there. Now, one related model is not enough though. We now added this one-to-many location relation, but now I also want to add participants that can sign up for our meetups. Because that's some functionality which we will later add to our frontend, to the user-facing part of this website. There, if we are on this detail page, 
where we should also display this image now that I look at it. There, I later want to display some form here, which allows us to sign up with our email address. And then we should be stored in the database as a participant if we do that. And therefore, we need a model for this. Hence here, I'll add another class in the models py file, and I'll name it participant. Name, of course, is up to you, but you need to inherit from models.model. And now we can define how a participant record should look like in the database. And here I'll keep it fairly simple. I just want to have an email being stored. And for that, we can actually use the char field or even better, the email field. The email field comes with some extra validation that ensures that we really store an email address in there and not some random text. I'll also set this to unique true to ensure that we can't add multiple records with the same email address here. And I'll also add the str method here to make sure that we actually return the email address as a string representation if that model instance or if a model instance is needed in string form, for example, for the admin dashboard. Now we got this model added here, but now the idea is to again create a connection to our meetup here. And for that, I'll first of all delete that meetup which we deleted before, uh, which we created before, because we're going to change it again. And now here, I want to set up a many-to-many -many relation. Many-to-many -many because one meetup can have multiple participants and one participant can sign up for multiple meetups. You can use the same email address to sign up for different meetups. Therefore, I'll add a participants key here to my meetup class. But now it's not models for n key, which we would use for a one-to-many relation but instead it's the many-to-many -many field, which we use for a, guess what, many-to-many -many relation. And here we now again point at the related model, participant, and we only need to do this in one of the two models. We could do it in both. I could add a meetups key here in participant and point at meetup, at least theoretically, but practically I can't because, um, well, I have a cyclical dependency. Meetup is defined after I try to use it and it's also not required. I could define it here and not there if I switch the order, but defining it in one of the two models is enough. Now here, I want to make sure though that you don't have to have participants, that this field can be empty. And by the way, technically, it's now not a field or a column in the database table where related record IDs are stored, but instead behind the scenes, Django will create an extra table, a matching table between these two models, you could say, where one row is added per relation. Because it's a many-to-many -many relation, you can have multiple IDs um, stored here for this relation in both models, that would not work, hence we have a separate table in between. But I want to make sure that we don't need to have any related records at all, because initially a meetup has no participants and that's fine. And we do this by adding the blank keyword argument here to the many-to-many -many field and setting this to true. You can add that to any model field, by the way. If it's allowed to be empty, you can allow this by adding blank true. This will ensure that if a new entry is added through the admin dashboard, for example, the input field there in the form, which is presented by the dashboard, may be empty. Now this blank option here really only configures whether a value must be provided through the form that is being used for creating a new record, for example, on the admin dashboard or not. And if we set blank to true as we do it here, then we say that we don't need to provide a related uh, record when creating a new meetup. Now, we also can add null equals true as an additional option. And I will say right away, for the many-to-many -many field, this actually won't have an effect. We can add it, but it won't have an effect. But for other fields, it will have an effect. The blank config defines, as I mentioned, whether the field in the form may be empty. 
With null equal to true, we tell Django that in the database table which it creates, for this field, we can have a null entry, which is a special database value in SQL databases. So if no value is provided, because blank values are allowed, null would be stored as a value in the database. And therefore you often set both, that you are fine with not getting a value and that in such a case, this special null value would be stored. Now in case of the many-to-many -many field, it's not important, null equals true doesn't have any fact there, because as I mentioned before, the related data is not stored in a database column anyways, instead we have a in-between table between the related tables, and therefore if we don't add a relation, no record is created in that in-between table. That's all. So nothing is added there and therefore no special null value or anything like that is added. Simply nothing is added in this case. With this many-to-many -many relation added, we now again need to do what? Yes, run our migrations again because we added a brand new model and edited an existing one. So again, we can run Python manage py make migrations. We need to do this whenever we change something about our uh, models. And then we run migrate. Now in case you wonder why this time it did not get this prompt to provide a default value, the reason is that I allow this field to be empty. And with that setting being in place, Django of course has no problem to add it possibly existing previous records because it is able to just not have any uh, related records for existing records. That's fine with those settings and that's why we did not get this prompt here. Now with that we can again run our server of course and now if I reload I don't see participants here in the admin area. And the reason for that is that I did not register participants here in the admin py file. Now we could absolutely do that if you want to manage participants through that interface. And I do want to do that also because I want to see which participants we have in our database in general. And therefore I'll import participant here from models in the admin py file and then simply register, whoops, register participant here and again we could configure it if we want to but I'll leave it like this and now we have our participants of course none at the moment and those will also not primarily be managed through this admin interface uh, but instead through this user facing frontend in the future once we added this form. But now let's add a new meetup again. Uh, first meetup again uh, uh, first meetup, choose the file which I prepared, choose a location. We could add some default participants, but we don't have to. And save that and I'll add a second meetup as well. Or actually, I won't do that right now. But if I now go back to the starting page here, like this, then I again see my meetup here. So that is working. And now, before we work on that form to allow users to sign up, I just want to quickly also make sure that the image shows up on this detail page and I want to tweak my models one last time because the meetup model should not just have the fields which it currently has, but it should also have an organizer email and a date when it takes place. Feel free to try that on your own. We'll do it together as a next step. So let's tweak this together now. As I said, I want to have a date field and an organizer email field. So I'll add a organizer email field and theoretically you could also make organizer another related model so that organizers are standalone records in the database, maybe with their own name and so on. That would absolutely be possible. Here I'll keep it a bit simpler and just add a standard field, not a relation. But I'll use the email field here to make sure that we really have an email stored for our organizer email. And then I want to have a date 
And there we got the date field conveniently, which ensures that a date is stored here and not some random string or anything like this. And that's how easy it is to adjust this meetup. I would now also argue, and that's of course optional, but I would argue that in the admin configuration, it would make sense that we're able to filter based on the date and hence I'll add this to my list filter tuple as well and also add it instead of the slug to my list display and whilst we're there, maybe add the location as another column in this list display uh, configuration field here. And uh, with that, since I tweaked the model, of course it's time to migrate again. And uh, actually for that, I'll restart that server quickly. And in this admin area, I want to delete the existing entry as I did it before. For that, I'll temporarily comment out these fields and um, actually also temporarily comment out these fields where I refer to date. So that in my admin area, I can delete the existing entry here real quick. And then thereafter, I'll comment back in these fields in meetup admin and uh, these fields here in my model. And now with all of that, we can of course again make our migrations. So make migrations. And uh, even though we don't have any past values, we need to provide a default value. And now we're talking about the date field here. So here I'll provide a default value of 2021-04-12 or something like this. Should just be a valid date format, but other than that, it doesn't matter. And for the email address, I'll provide test at test.com. But again, those values won't really be used. Nonetheless, we have to define them here. And then we can run the migrations by running the migrate command. Now, with that, we now did update our database. Now I can run my server again with the run server. And just as a side note, I also already want to output the image here on this detail page as soon as we have um, another meetup again. And therefore on this meetup details page where I also have this image here, I want to output my meetup image and some alt text and also output the address and the location down there. And for that actually in views PY, we definitely want to make sure that we provide all that data to our view either by providing the entire meetup or by providing the different uh, things like title and description and so on standalone. And that's what we did up to this point, but that will become a bit cumbersome here. So I'll switch now and provide the entire selected meetup here as a meetup variable to my meetup details template. And then in this meetup details template, we can now interact with that. So here we could then output meetup.image.url as you learned. And as an alt text, maybe meetup.title. And for the location, even though it's a related model, we can simply do meetup.location.name because every location has a name and then an address. And that's how we can work with related models in our templates as well, how we can access related properties. It's as easy as that. We do the same here for the address, meetup location dot address. And um, then here for the description, it's now meetup dot description, since we're now passing the entire meetup to the template. And uh, for the title, it's meetup dot title here. Also here for this title block, meetup dot title. And with all that done, if I now save this, and I go back to meetups. We got no meetups yet. Hence here in the admin area, we can now add a new meetup. And again, it's a first meetup, but now it's the last time that we add it. I add some organizer email, test at test.com. For the date field, we conveniently get this date picker. So here we can uh, choose some random date. Well, actually maybe uh, let's pick one in the future. And then here, this is a first meetup, could be the description for the image. I'll pick the image we used many times before. 
I'll then choose my location and I'll create that. And now I'll also create a second meetup with test2 at test.com, picking some other date here. This is the second meetup and that takes the same image though, because it's the only image I prepared. Choose New York, click save. And we now got these two meetups also here on this page. And if I visit one of these meetups, I now got the image here. It's super big. We need to style that. But we see the location, we see all the other data. And therefore now let's just make sure that this uh, meetup image is not that big. And for this in the meetup details template on this image, we can add the ID main image because I did define some special styles for this ID. And if we do that and reload, this looks much better. And now we got that finished. Now we are managing all the data we need for this basic demo application. We are outputting all the data and we're able to manage all the data here in this admin uh, interface, which we get by Django. Now the last feature I wanna dive in are forms for our visitors. Because up to this point, all the data we added was added through this administration interface. And there's nothing wrong with that. But of course, that's only available to us as the site owner or to anyone who we add as an admin. But our regular site users won't have access to that. And they shouldn't have. They don't know the password. But this form, which I want to add here, where every visitor of our website will be able to sign up, that of course should then handle that input from any random visitor and that input should also end up in the database. And that's something we haven't added before and that's therefore what we'll dive in next. So to allow the visitors of our website to enter some data, we need to present a form to them. And of course, for that, we can go to our template where I want to have that form and we could add a form like this. And we could then start adding all the input fields which we want, in this case, an email input field because we're interested in the user email and uh, we could implement it like this. And there would be nothing wrong about that and we can handle forms like this when working with Django. I also do show this approach in my course. But there is an even more convenient one, again, using a lot of Django magic behind the scenes, if you want to call it like this. We can define a form class using an official feature offered by Django to let Django generate this form for us and to then also let Django handle the entire form validation and so on. And for this in my meetups folder here, I'll add a new forms PY file next to admin py and so on and in there we should import from django the forms object here and then we can create a class which we could name registration form the name is up to you which should inherit from forms.model form this allows us to let django infer a form and all the validation rules from a model we defined in our application so therefore I'll import from my models uh, file and from there I'll import the participant model. Then we connect this uh, registration form to a specific model by defining a meta class in there, a nested class, which might look strange but is a default Python feature. And here in this meta class we now define what the related model should be. We do this with a model key here and we can set this equal to the model we want to connect this form to or we want to Django let infer this form from to be precise. So now with that Django will look at this participant model and then infer a form from the fields defined in this model. Which in this case is this email field and nothing else. But if we had more fields, more fields would be inferred. Now we use the meta class for this because in this overall registration form class we could also add our own fields and form specific configuration. But here I just want to have Django infer this form from that model like this. And um, we also then should add a fields key here where we specify a list of fields that should be included in the form. 
And here I'll use email. This would allow you to restrict the fields that should be populated through a form. If you had a model with more fields than just email, and maybe some fields should not be entered by your users, then you could only list the fields that should be populated by your users here in this fields uh, field, in this fields property. In this case, I add email here, which is my only field, but with that, I ensure that this model can be created by my visitors by using that form, which Django is inferring for me. But that's all nice. How do we now use that form in this template? For this, we need to go to our views because the views are responsible for rendering the template. And here it's this meetup details view, which is uh, important to us because there we render that detail page. And in here, I now wanna make sure that my form gets rendered as well. So here we can now create the registration form by simply instantiating this registration form class we just worked on. So therefore, we need to import it from forms. We need to import the registration form. And then down here, we just instantiate registration form like this. Now we have a registration form object and we can now pass that to our template. For example, under a form key, but the key name is up to you, of course. Now, if we do that, we can go back to the template and here, instead of manually outputting this input now, we can interpolate form or whichever key name you chose here. In my case, it's form. And then call as ul on it, which will simply put every input label row into its own list item. And therefore we should wrap this with a UL element, which is of course just one way of presenting a form, but it is the approach I will use here. Now a small side note about as UL, there also is as P as an alternative to render paragraphs, which wrap your individual form inputs instead of list items. It's simply an alternative, but most importantly, it's worth pointing out that as ul and as p are actually methods on this form object, which we instantiated in our view. And yet, as you can see here, there are no parentheses when we call this method here, when we call as ul. And that's another special thing about the DTL, the Django templating language, when you invoke methods in there, no matter if you wrote them, so if you call a method on one of your objects, or if it's a method on a built-in object from Django, you don't add parentheses. You access your methods like regular properties. This is simply how it works here in your templates, and it is something you need to know. If you want to output the result of a method call, you just reference that method, so you just use it like this, like a property, and that's it. So now all the input label combinations will be rendered as list items in this unordered list. Please note that you still need to bring your own form HTML element. It's only the inputs which are being output by Django, but those are now rendered for you with help of that auto-inferred form. And that's not all Django will do for us here. Now I wanna add a div below this unordered list, which I give an idea of registration actions. And in there, I wanna have my submit button where I say register. And if we do all of this, and we restart our development server here. Then if I reload this page, I now got this form down there. Of course, it's just one input field here, but that's better than nothing. It is our form rendered automatically by Django. And if you inspect this input here, which was created by Django, you will notice that the input type here is email. 
And it is email because Django inferred this form and the inputs that would be needed and the form or the type of inputs that are needed from our model. And since I defined an email field here for email, Django was able to infer that an email input field should be rendered here when we output that form. But of course, outputting the form is just the first step. We also want to handle form submission. Now, how can we handle the submission of this form then? Well, to handle that, we need to go back to our template, first of all. Because there you probably know that you control what happens when this button is clicked by setting the right attributes on this form HTML element. To be precise, you can set the action and the method attribute here. Method controls which type of HTTP request will be sent. And we have get or post available here. Get is um, the default, but actually we want post here because post is the most standard and common way of submitting user entered data to a server. This will send a post HTTP request. Action then defines the URL to which this request should be sent. And this URL is of course up to you, but here I wanna send it to this meetup details uh, URL again. Why to this URL and not a different one? Because if the user enters something invalid here, let's say test at test without dot com at the end or anything like that, then I want to present this page again and show an error message to the user. So that's why I want to send this request to this um, existing URL instead of a brand new one, because I potentially might want to show this existing page again. And because that's the case, the URL I want to send my request to can be constructed with the URL tag here. And then here, I just want to point at meetup-details and use meetup.slug as a value for my slug. Because meetup-details, of course, is this path and we need to provide a value for this dynamic slug segment. Now that will send a post request to that URL when we click this button. So now the form can be submitted. But actually we would be getting an error here because there is a default security mechanism built into Django when we submit forms. To ensure that we prevent cross-site request forgery attacks, an attack pattern where an attacker basically uh, rebuilds your site, so the visuals of your site on some other server and um, then utilizes the fact that visitors might not see that they're on a different page to then trick visitors to do something they don't wanna do. To prevent this attack pattern, we add another tag here, the CSRF token tag. That injects a cross-site request forgery token a prevention mechanism, so to say, into this form. And that token is generated by the Django server and only the Django server knows the valid token. And if some attacker rebuilds your site on their own server to then send requests to your server, doing other things behind the scenes as users might think though, then this attacker won't have this token because it's generated by your server and your attacker's server can't know it. So that's why this token is added as a security mechanism in this form here. More information about CSRF attacks can be found in a separate article, which I'll also attach to this video here. So that's something we have to add. But now with that, the form can technically be submitted. Now we also have to handle the form submission in our view though, because that is where the request will arrive ultimately. And that's now where things get interesting. Up to this point, this view only handled get requests if a user enters a URL like this in the browser or clicks a link that leads to this URL. Now, since we send a post request, here to the same URL, we also need to handle post requests here. 
And we want to do different things if we got an incoming POST request uh, than we do if we have an incoming GET request. If we have a GET request, we want to return our meetup details template. If we have a POST request, we want to validate the user input and maybe return this template again. But also maybe if the forum validation succeeds, save that data to the database and redirect the user to some confirmation page, which we have yet to add. And that's why here I will add a if check and check if request method is equal to get. So if we got a get request like this. If that's the case, then I want to do what I did before. Else, if we got a POST request, then I want to do something else. Surprisingly, I guess. Now, what I want to do in the else case is I want to validate the user input. And for this here, we can create registration form again by instantiating it. But now we pass request.post to it. The incoming request, which we get by Django, will have a POST property, which contains any submitted data that might be attached to the incoming POST request. So in our case, the submitted form data. And we're now passing this to registration form. And Django then will automatically parse that uh, submitted POST data and map it to the expected fields we have in that form. And we can then call is valid on this registration form to trigger validation and return true if it succeeds or false if it fails. And it would fail, for example, if test at test is submitted. This is not a valid email address and is valid would fail. Therefore, I want to check if is valid succeeds because if that's the case, if this returns true, then I want to store my data in the database. And that's now super simple. Since we use a form that inherits from model form, all we got to do is we have to call registration form dot save. And this will now save a new entry for the model on which our form is based to the database. So that will do all the behind the scenes work of adding a new registration to the database. Now I want to point out that with this approach of calling save here and using a model form, we will actually only be able to use an email address once across all meetups. And that will not be the final behavior we want and we'll fine tune it later. But for the moment, that's just a little restriction I want to make you aware of so that you don't get confused if you then soon try this on your own and you try running this app and you're not able to use the same email address to sign up for different meetups. That is a restriction we'll work on later. And calling save will also return an instance of the saved uh, model. So a participant in our case. So this returns the participant that was inserted into the database. And we need that participant to then also update our meetup. Because keep in mind that our meetup has a many to many relation to the participants. So if we add a new participant to the database and we did add it because a user signed up for this meetup, we definitely want to add a connection to that created participant for that specific meetup. And for this in views.py, I'll grab selected meetup and actually remove that from this get check here and add it in general in this try block so that I also have it available down there. And then here I will reach out to this selected meetup to participants there. So to this many-to-many -many field, which I defined. And on such a many-to-many -many field, we can now call the add method to add a new related record. So in this case, it's this participant, which we created here, which I want to add as a related record to my selected meetup. And once that is done, we are done with saving that data to the database. Now, if we don't make it into this if block, because the form is not valid, I want to render, I want to return that same meetup details page. So I will actually grab that render statement 
and add that after this if else block here. So that we always return this rendered template no matter if we had a get or post request. Of course, I don't want to return that though if validation succeeded and we saved data to the database. Then I don't want to return the meetup page again, but instead in this case, I want to redirect the user to a to be created confirmation page. And that's therefore what we'll add next. And of course, you can also try this on your own as a practice. Add a new URL and a new view and a new template to have some form of registration confirmation page. So here I will add my registration success template here in the meetups folder in the templates folder. And of course, it's totally up to you how you want to structure this page. I will simply extend from the um, meetups base base HTML file as I did it in my other templates. I will load the static module since I plan on constructing some static URLs. I'll set a value for the title block here. And of course also end this block therefore. And here my title is you registered success fully, something like this. Then I also wanna have a block with some site CSS, which I'll add in a second. And we'll add this block here. And um, then I also wanna have a main heading block targeting this main heading here, if you forget about that. And there I just want to say thanks for signing up. Something like this. Keep it rather simple. And then add another block, the body block with the actual page content. And here it's totally up to you what you want to add. I will just add a section with an idea of confirmation. And in that section, I'll add a h2 tag where I say you registered successfully. And then a paragraph where I say thanks for signing up. See you at the meetup. And another paragraph where I'll say got questions or can't make it. Please contact the organizer ahead of time. And here I want to make sure that we actually link to the organizer email address. And we'll do that in a second. For the moment it's an empty link. And then below that we can add another section with an idea of continue maybe uh, where I say of course you can sign up for more than one meetup and another paragraph where I say explore our meetups and that should actually be a link. So here I'll add another anchor tag and wrap that around this entire text. And the that link here will get a class of BTN, which is a class I prepared in the base CSS styles I gave you earlier. And the link here will be hard coded because I just want to redirect back to slash meetups. So that's now the general template I want to have. Now, just as before, I prepared some styles in advance. This registration dash confirmation CSS file, which you find attached. And it's now this style file, which I want to import here in my template between the site CSS block tags. So here we can create a new link. And then again, generate this static URL dynamically by pointing at meetups slash styles slash registration dash confirmation CSS. That should work, hopefully. So that's the template, the template I came up with. Now in the views py file, we need to add a brand new view that returns and renders this template if we did sign up. So for this, I'll add a brand new view function here, the confirm registration function, which gets a request, of course. 
And here I then want to return the rendered template and we pass request to render as you know and then the name of the template we want to render in my case that is registration success.html and then maybe any context we want to pass in but for the moment I got none. Now in URLs py we can add a brand new path and that could be meetups slash success and add that in front of the path uh, with the dynamic path segment because if I add it thereafter um, success if this is part of the URL will be treated as a value for this dynamic segment and I don't want that so here I want to order this in front of this dynamic path segment and then here we want to point at views.confirm registration and give this a name of confirm dash registration maybe. That's the name for this path. Now we need to redirect to this page, to this URL, if we successfully saved data in the database. And for that in views py, here if we did save data in the database, after doing all of that, I want to redirect the user. And for that, we got another helpful shortcut, which we can import from Django shortcuts, and that's the redirect shortcut, which does what the name implies. We can return a value here if we saved data to the database, so that the other code here will not execute, and then call redirect to return a redirect response. And the difference is that we now redirect the user to a different URL. And redirect is really simple. We just pass in the name of the URL we want to redirect to. And in my case, that's this name here of this URL path we just added. So that's what I want to redirect to. And that is it. And actually one thing I just noticed, of course here the template I wanna render is meetups slash registration success. Because of course we have that meetup subfolder in templates. But with that, if we save this, I get no meetup found for this slug if I try to reload this a second meetup page. So something's wrong here. And um, the error actually is not that we did not find a meetup, this issue is just popping up or this error message is just showing up because that's our generic error handler here. But the actual error is a different one. We can see it if I print the exception that was thrown here. If I save that and reload, then we see that the error description is that a reverse for meetup details was not found. Which still might sound cryptic, but the problem is that in the end it did not find a uh, a URL with a name of meetup details. And indeed in URLs I just have meetup detail, not meetup details. Now you might be wondering where are we using meetup details? Well, it's in a meetup details HTML file for the form action. I'm referring to meetup details. That should be meetup detail. So rendering that template here is failing because of this error and that's why this render method here failed and why we saw this error uh, response here. With that fixed, if I reload, I get back this detail page in my form. And now if I enter something invalid here, without .com or something like this at the end, you see this page reloads and we get this error message, which is great. Now, why do we see this error here? Because if the form validation fails, if is valid, which we call in our view, does not return true, then keep in mind we render this existing page again and this existing page has this form. We always render this form. Now the thing is, if we submitted that form with some invalid data maybe, then Django will actually update this form object after we called is valid and store any potential errors it detected in that form object as well. So if we then render this 
template again with that form. It pre-populates the input fields with the values the user entered before and it shows these error messages which it gathered. So that's some additional convenience feature we get out of the box when working with Django and letting Django handling form submission. It gives us this form object which initially when we render this page for the first time is empty. It has no stored values in this case for the email. But if that form was submitted before, then if that page is rendered again because it's invalid maybe, then the old input is still there and extra error messages are also output automatically. That's really convenient. If I enter a valid email here though, then I indeed see the confirmation page. And if I go to my admin area, you see this participant now exists here. And if I have a look at my meetups for the second meetup, this participant was added here as well. So that's all working, saving the data in the database and establishing that connection, that's working. And the success page is also showing up. And therefore this entire flow is working as intended. Now there are only a couple of minor final polishing steps which I wanna take before we finished this entire demo project. And whilst doing that, we learned a lot about Django and some of its core features that make up Django. By now our demo app is pretty much finished and we learned a lot about Django and its core features. There are only a few minor tweaks and uh, polishing steps I want to take before we wrap up this course here. So what else could we fine tune or optimize? Well, we got a problem. If I do open such a meetup and I try to sign up with an email address which I already used, I get an error that a participant with this email already exists. Now what happens if I go to another meetup though, to the second meetup? Do I get the same issue here? I do. And that's a problem. Now it might make sense to show this kind of error if we try to sign up for a meetup with an email address we already did use for signing up to that meetup. Even though we could argue that in that case, it would also be no problem if we just accept this registration again and we just don't do anything about it behind the scenes. We just ignore it since the user already did sign up. But it makes absolutely no sense and it is an error if we show this error message if we try to sign up to another meetup with an email address we used for yet another meetup because of course we should be able to use the same email address to sign up for multiple meetups. And currently that fails. We can only use each email address once. Now, why is this happening? This happens because in views py, we do create a new participant with this line of code here by calling the save method. I do create a new participant here. And the problem is of course that Every participant can only be created once because in our model, we also set the email field to be unique. So if we try to sign up with the same email for different meetups, I try to create multiple participants with the same email and that fails. And of course, I don't wanna have the same email address multiple times in my database. So that generally is what I want. But what I'd like to change is that I don't always call save here, but I either save or I just get an existing participant. So I just look into the database and if I already have a participant for this email address, I take that participant instead of creating a new one. And of course, thankfully, that is also not an uncommon case and therefore something which is fairly easy to implement. Instead of calling save here, which of course is very convenient, but instead of calling that, we can also access the cleaned data field on our registration form. Cleaned data holds a dictionary and it holds all the data entered by the user as a key value pairs in that dictionary. So here I can access the email um, field, the email key, 
why email? Because this form is based on the participant model and from that model, from this model here, we use the email field and hence the field in the form will have that same name. So we can access this field, this uh, data which was entered by the user in that form under that key and that will give us access to the entered user email. So here we now get the user email. Now with that information, we can now create a participant ourselves. And I'm doing that because if I use the participant model for creating that participant instead of this form, then I have control over how it's created and I can check whether I do have a participant before I try to create a new one. So therefore in this views py file from the models uh, file, we can import participant, this model, and then in the view function here, we can use this participant model to create a new participant if we don't have one for this email address yet. We do this with participant objects and then get or create. That's a convenience method which Django offers to us, which allows us to create a new instance of that model and store it in the database if we don't have an existing record yet or use an existing one instead. And to get or create, we now just need to pass a keyword argument that allows Django to look into the database table and find a possibly existing entry. And here I wanna tell Django that it should look for the email field in this participant database table. And if we have an entry for this user email already, then I wanna use that existing participant object from the database if we don't find a participant with that email here, then I want to create a new one. That's what get or create does. Now get or create returns a tuple where we get the um, created or identified object and where we get a, a flag was created that tells us whether a new entry was created or not. Now I'm actually not interested in was created here so I'll use an underscore to signal that I'll ignore that value, but I am interested in the participant, which we either created or retrieved because it already existed. Because I wanna add this participant as a related participant to my selected meetup. That does not change. So that code line stays the same and the rest of the code stays the same. But now we have a more flexible creation method here. Now, one thing I do want to change though, is my form in the forms py file. Here we are currently using a model form, but actually using a model form is now kind of redundant here because we don't use the save method anymore and we are inferring our form from a very simple model anyways. And therefore I want to introduce another way of building such a form object. Model form can be convenient if you want to infer a form from a model and then use the save method, but you can also build a form object which gives you all that validation logic and so on by just inheriting from the form class instead of model form. With that you have to define all the form fields on your own, but of course here in this case that's very easy to do because we don't have a complex uh, form which we want to build here. Here, I just want to make sure that we have an email field. So now we add fields to our form by adding them as simple class variables. And we now tell Django by using this forms object, which kind of form field that will be. And that should be an email field, which of course should not be confused with the email field I have in my model here. This email field is coming from the models object. In forms py, it's coming from the forms object. Here it's just used to tell Django which kind of input field, which HTML input field should be created and how the input should be validated. This will not have an effect on any database because this is now really just there to collect user data through a form. It has no relation to any database or anything like that. And therefore now here I'll remove that model import of the participant model and just create my form field like this. And here we can also add a label keyword argument to tell Django what the form uh, label for that email field should be. 
And here I'll just say your email. That should be my label like this. And if I now save this and I reload this uh, page for a single meetup, you see I got the same form as before, but now with that your email label. And now if I try to sign up with an email address that I used before, this succeeds here. This succeeds because now we have this updated form, which is decoupled from the participant model. And we have the updated views code where we check for the existence of this object before we possibly create a new entry in the database. And that's some extra fine tuning which I wanted to add here to make sure that we have the correct and intended behavior for this sign up process, which we of course also want to have as part of this application. So what else could we fine tune or optimize? The first polishing step I want to take is that in my meetup details HTML page, uh, of course, there we actually do have this need more details, please contact the organizer text and contact the organizer is a link. Now we do have the organizer email. In our meetup model, we added that organizer email field, which holds an email address. And I'd like to convert this link into a link that opens the mail client of the visitor and starts composing an email to that organizer. And we can do that by using the mail to instruction here in the value which we pass to this ref attribute. Now this is a standard HTML browser feature. It's not Django specific, this instruction. But after this instruction, after the colon, we can now enter the email address to which an email should be uh, composed when this client opens. And that of course should be dynamic and depend on the meetup we're viewing here. Because in the meetup we got that organizer email stored. And therefore, of course, we can use interpolation again here to dynamically inject a value into this attribute value and here reach out to meetup.organizer email because ultimately that is the email address I want to output here. And if I do that here and then I run my development server, if I view my meetup, this link here, if I click it, actually will open my mail client and start composing an email. Here it is, my default operating system mail client opened up a new email and uh, it already filled in this to value, which is that organizer email address. So that's working, but that's not the only place where I wanna output that email address. Because if I sign up, if I register for a meetup and I'm on this confirmation page, here I also got this contact the organizer link and there I want to do the same thing. Now for this, of course, on this registration success page, I need to know um, the email address of the organizer of that meetup. And at the moment, we don't have that information on this page because at the moment we reach this page when we get redirected here from inside the meetup details view, we redirect to this page if we do sign up successfully. And we redirect to this view here in the end. And in there, we of course have no information about the meetup for which we registered. So that's something which I'd like to change. And for this, we need to add some information about the meetup for which we registered successfully to the URL here for example, the slug, so that we can fetch the meetup data from the database in this view as well. And of course, that is something we did before already. In the URLs py file, where we have all our paths, we might want to edit this success path a little bit and actually add a dynamic segment to it. So in there, I actually want to add a new path segment. And this should be a dynamic segment before we have slash success. And for this dynamic segment here, I want to have my slug and give it an identifier of meetup slug. So that this URL here also contains the slug of the meetup for which we signed up. 
That of course means that when we do redirect to this page here, we need to pass in a value for this dynamic path segment. And the redirect function makes that very easy. We can simply pass a keyword argument where we use the identifier of this dynamic segment, which we set up in the URL, meetup slug in my case. And we use that as a keyword argument. So we use meetup slug as a keyword argument and then assign a value that will be used for constructing that redirection URL. And in this case, the value is also meetup slug because I'm getting this as an argument here in the meetup details function. And I wanna use that value again for constructing a new URL for redirecting to this page. With that, if we go back here and I do register for a meetup, I um, have a participant with this email already. So let's use a new email. And now we get a little error here. We now see that here I got this URL and that confirm registration got an unexpected keyword argument. And that should make sense. We had this error before already. We are getting this error because this view function is not yet prepared to handle this extra dynamic segment. We can prepare it by simply accepting this extra keyword argument, this extra parameter here. And of course the parameter name has to equal our identifier name, which we chose here. But with that, if I save this, if I reload, now I can see this uh, confirmation page. And what's the benefit of seeing this page now? Well, the benefit simply is that now we got this meetup slug information and in this view, in this confirm registration view, we can use that to use our meetup model and get a specific meetup, get the meetup for this meetup slug. Now we also might want to handle the case that we don't find that meetup, just as we did it up there in uh, meetup details, where we also try this code. We could do that. But here I'll keep it very simple and just assume that we always do find it because that's not a page users should enter manually in the URL bar. We should really only reach this page after getting redirected. But once we fetched this meetup now, we can pass some information into our template, the organizer email key, for example, and then use data from our meetup here, the organizer email. And when we do that, with that extra uh, information passed into this template, in the template we can of course use that data and interpolate the email address here, again combined with the mail to instruction like this. Organizer email is the key I chose in my dictionary for the data which I passed to this template, hence I just reference it like this. And now with that, if I reload this page, I get another error. Um, yeah, I get this error because this syntax is wrong. That should be slug equals meetup slug because of course I'm looking for the meetup where the slug field in a database record for this model is equal to meetup slug. So we're looking for a record in the database where the slug field has a value of the meetup slug value we're getting as a parameter here. And with that, if we save it now, that can be reloaded. And now here again, if I uh, would click this link, the mail client would open. I can see it in the bottom left corner. It's very hard to see for you probably that this link does have the correct ref value. And uh, with that, I'm happy with this confirmation page and how we use that email address. But we're still not done entirely. There are two other things I'd like to optimize and fine tune before we wrap this up. So now that's it for the core functionality. The last thing I want to do here before we conclude this course is related to our URLs again. At the moment, if we just enter our domain slash nothing, we get a 404 error because we have to enter slash meetups. And that's not something I'd like to have like this. Instead here in the main URLs py file, so in this folder carrying our project name, 
Here, I want to make sure that for just entering nothing, we automatically are redirected to the meetups URL. That would be nice to have. And in addition, if we have a look at our app URLs, we see that they all start with meetups slash. That's not a problem, but of course, also a lot of repetition. I'd like to change these URLs in this app URLs py file such that I don't have meetups slash here in these URLs, but instead I only have the uh, parts that are actually different between those URLs in this file. And in the main URLs py file, I instead have my URLs configured such that we do have a new path in here, a path where I have meetups slash as a prefix, and I then include meetups.urls. So what I did here before. But here I don't want to do it anymore, but instead if we entered nothing after our domain, I'd like to redirect to this meetups path and to these meetups related URLs. And that can be achieved by importing a special view which is built into Django, which we can use to redirect users automatically if a certain URL is entered. And that view is imported by importing Django views generic base. And from that module, we import the redirect view. This is a so-called class-based view. And there are other class-based views as well. I take a closer look at them in my full course. But in general, the idea behind these class-based views is that they have built-in functionalities, which we can then easily reuse without having to write a lot of code on our own. And here, that means that we can use this redirect view as a view. And for this, we have to call the as view method on that redirect view object or class here. And then we pass a URL keyword argument to as view, and we specify the URL we want to redirect to, in this case, slash meetups. Which means that if nothing, if our domain slash nothing is entered, I want to redirect to slash meetups, so to this path, and then here we have the meetup specific URLs. And then with that change made, if I save that, if I now visit localhost 8000 slash nothing, I'm automatically redirected to slash meetups. And of course, we can also still manually enter slash meetups if we want to, but if we don't, we are automatically redirected. So that's another little adjustment which I want to make, since I would say that this page now works in a more expected way, and we don't have this annoying 404 error if we just enter our domain slash nothing. Now that's it for this course, for this introductory course. We covered a lot of important Django concepts here. We had a look at URLs, at working with the database, with models and migrations. And we had a look at relations, one to many and many to many. We had a look at forms. We had a look at views and which kind of code we can write in there to use the data users might have provided to us and to then output templates in the correct way. Because that's another key feature we learned about. We learned about templates, that we can write our own HTML code with dynamic um, segments or dynamic values inside of these templates so that we can send back different responses based on these blueprints to the visitors of our website. We also had a detailed look at this admin feature, at this admin dashboard, and we had a first look at how we can configure and fine tune it. And therefore, we covered all these key features that make up Django. If you want to dive deeper, if you want to learn more about Django, as mentioned multiple times throughout this video, of course, have a look at my full course, because in that complete course, we will, of course, dive into all these key features and a couple of other features in greater detail.